Welcome to the stream. How are you guys doing? It's time. It's been a while since we've had one of these, but it is going to be a King of the Hill, so it's random factions, which makes it extra wild and uh, certainly tests the might of the various champions. But game one here is going to be Professor Pwn facing off against Leech Lord here on the battle for Itza, so I'm going to roll up their armies and send them their way. And players will also get one reroll, so if they get something they really don't want to play, they can reroll. So, All right, so rolling for the first army right now. Let's get it. Yes, yes. So for Professor Pwn, he is going to be getting uh, dwarves almost? No, not quite. He's going to be getting high elves. Wow, that's his favorite faction too. All right, so Pwn is going to be on high elves, and his opponent is going to be playing, just doing the old roll off screen here. And, uh, oh my God, is a high elf mirror? No, it's not. Okay. High elves versus Norska. All right, that's not bad. It's actually a pretty fun, even matchup, it would seem. So you got... High Elves, and Leech Lord is going to get Norska. Reroll. Let's see if they want to reroll, and we're going to see if uh, Professor Pone wants to reroll. And then we can go from there. All right, so players are going to fire it up. Pone knows he got his beloved High Elves. Oh, you're going to be getting Imric, most likely. I mean, I would assume Pone wants to win. He could bring in like, characters like Eltharian, but against Norska, you're going to want Imric, because Imric can dominate the Mammoths. He can crush the Marauder Champions. Breath attacks are really good. This is first come, first serve. So you just have to have the total tavern map pack installed. And then when one player jumps out and a spot opens up, you just jump in. So that's basically it. Orc boar chariots. Yeah, they don't get used too much. Like they're really redundant with how good squigs are, unfortunately. That's just how it is though. That's just how it is. All right. So it looks like they're both fine. Pone's like, no, I'm not rerolling. I'll take a bit of Norska. All right, cool. So we got Norska versus High Elves here in game one, a matchup uh, that used to be somewhat common. I feel like we used to see this one all the time in some of the earlier patches, but kind of fell by the wayside as some of these factions like Kislev got a little bit too powerful for their own good. Are you all ready to join the pack and have a Hyenas launch tournament? Oh God, dude, please no. Don't put that evil on me. Yeah, I don't know. It, it could be kind of funny just as a joke, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> Yeah, this is good. As an American saying in Europe, I finally get your weird stream times. Yeah, it's finally all clicking, right? Today was a little bit earlier, though. I mean, a lot of Europe, it's like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. So it's not the worst. You know, it's not the worst. And I'm going to be starting to progressively stream earlier and earlier as uh, as the weather's finally cooling down. So we could do some early streams. So should be good. Should be good. So anyone's welcome to join. The score at the top, if you do see it, uh, the left-hand side is the current king and their score. And the right-hand side is the score to beat. So if, for example, the king loses the and has the highest score at the time, their score will be represented on the right-hand side. So you're going to be able to see uh, what needs to be beaten to win today's King of the Hill. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm more of a night person, though. That's, that's why my streams usually have been late at night. I just, uh, I love staying up late. You know, I'm a creature of the night. Like, I think best at night. I'm, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just I love staying up till like two or three a.m. just watching a show or hobbying or something. It's uh, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. Yeah, it's good times. Twenty three seventeen. Yeah, in Germany right now. Yeah, not too bad, Johannes. Hope you're doing well, man. You're gonna get in here, allied. Are you gonna do battle? Gonna carry your Age of Empires action over to uh, Total War. Love to see it. Um, by the way, a lot of Age of Empires stuff coming up on November 14th, I think, is the release of the new expansion. So it's going to be adding the Byzantines as well as the Japanese and a couple uh, kind of spin-off civs, which is very fun. I'm excited for that. Turn, why do you have such a wonderful stream going on right now? And now I'm so tired. <laughs> hey, just put it on as you go to sleep. You know, that's what I do. That's what I do. Indeed. Yeah, the Boar Boy Chariots, if they nerf Squigs a little bit, I think they could be decent. So I would imagine the players are about ready for their builds. Pwn sending a message that he is ready to party. So he readies up with his cool Heil flag that he does have here. And Norska is not ready yet, but they will be soon. I'm kind of I'm curious about the Norskan build. Is it going to be Marauder Champions with great weapons? They certainly can do very well against the uh, Silver and Guard, which are super meta. But the problem with that is that they can get Breath Attacked and Isolated by Dragons and Magic. So sometimes if you go a little bit too elite, you can pay the Troll Toll. You know, you could have a little bit of a rough time. Dude, I haven't played uh, Johannes. I haven't played Age of Empires 2 since I was like, dude, God, okay, what year would that have been? Uh, let me check, dude. A AOE 2, release dates. Yeah, I would have played it right on release. So that would have been like 1999. Wow, so I would have been 11 years old. 
Yeah, I haven't played it since I was like 11 or 12. You're having me 1v1 as a massacre. <laughs> I did okay for a second match. Yeah, he's very good. He's very good. I've I played Yuravity in 1v1, I think twice. And I think I won one and he won one. One time I beat his Chinese with English uh, by just doing a longbow rush. And then the other time I think he just out macroed me. I, ca I can't quite remember how that went down. Yeah, he's a really good player, man. Very, very strong fundamentals. All right, Norska is ready. Looks like, a, oh man, he's he's got the Throg banner, baby. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, that's crazy. 1999. What a year, dude. I remember listening to Sugar Ray and Smash Mouth and uh, <laughs> all these bands in the 90s. That's crazy, man. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, no, I know Age of Empires 2 is really big. It's a, it's a cool game. I'm glad that it's managed to stand the test of time. So Pwn is going to be coming in with what appears to be a double dragon build. So good to be trying to get fat breath attacks. And uh, Norska does have some good monster hunting tools, however. They can use javelins and skin wolves and... All sorts of stuff like that to uh, kind of press the dragon. So we'll have to see how this unfolds here. Wolfric versus Imric. Imric, of course, a much better duelist. He would be able to crush Wolfric in combat. Wolfric, uh, unfortunately, doesn't have armor piercing. So he really does struggle to actually take down a lot of really heavy duelist characters, which is a bit of a shame considering he's supposed to be like a legendary duelist in Warhammer Fantasy, but it is what it is. I mean, he's wielding a sword, and typically swords aren't supposed to have armor piercing unless you're like the Akshina ambushers, which for some godforsaken reason have armor piercing in melee. Do you Citadel paints? Yeah, I usually do. I just buy them at Games Workshop. I'm pretty lazy. Yeah. All right, guys. So for the Elven build here in the front line of Professor Pwn, it's going to be Silver and Guard and the Sunset, uh, five of them. And they're the best infantry unit on Hyle Froster. Um, it looks like it's one base experiment and four Silverins, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, they're crazy good. When the game actually starts and their martial prowess is active, they have like over 50 melee defense, pretty good melee attack at like 33, and good armor, silver shields, high leadership. I mean, what more do you want out of an infantry unit, right? Really good. Rangers aren't bad in this matchup. They can certainly clear out crappy marauders. Like if you get a ranger engaged against like a, just a basic marauder or a marauder with great weapon, they'll trade upwards super well. Or I mean down, I mean, they're, they're more expensive, but they'll crush them in combat is essentially what we're trying to say here. We do have Imric and a dragon, so it's going to be a sun dragon. So we got double breath attacks. And depending on how, Pwn is usually pretty good with his breath attacks. When we practice in our games, he usually does uh, a pretty great job with those bad boys. So we're going to see if he's going to be able to recreate that magic. Now, Leech Lord on the other side, a very, very strong player, of course. Leech Lord, multi-time tournament winner in previous seasons. So he certainly knows how to party. And he is going to be rocking Marauders in the front with cheap Marauder great weapons in the secondary. Wolfric on horseback, going to be dropping Sea Fangs on those Silverins and other units. And the caster is probably going to be a metal caster, I think is what I saw. Yep, with Plague of Rust, going to be trying to uh, maybe Plague of Rust down some of the high elf armor, get some javelins, or just allow his marauders to do more DPS. And Searing Doom is a great spell. You just drop this on the archer. So if there's like Lothar and Sea Guard positions, different things like that, you can do pretty good indeed. All right, guys, game soon to be on. The battle for Itza. The two mighty champions stand at the ready. A little bit of pressure up on the high ground as we do have some marauder horsemen and throwing axes. But it is time. I have to admit, I played some High Elves last night, and I, I had quite a bit of fun playing them. I was like, man, this actually feels pretty good. Like a silver and guard front line with solid archers in the back. It's a, it's a fun playstyle. It is a fun playstyle indeed. All right, guys. Battle's on. Here comes Imrek. Here comes the Walmart dragon. They could just honestly take some free dives. Until Norska calls in something to punish the dragons, they could just go in and attack, no problem. And I would wager that Pwn is going to be calling out a Mage of Life like pretty soon. If you're going to be going with Double Dragon and you don't have heals, you're just basically a potato. You really need to do that. So a couple of Spearmen heading up to the high ground. Marauder's going to beat them in combat. Don't actually know who's wins between a Marauder and a Spearman. Spearmen do have 50 melee defense, so I can see them maybe edging that out. But, you know, we'll see. Marauder Horsemen, a pretty good answer against dragons. They can just kind of chase them and be obnoxious. So what you do if you're the elves is you call Northern Sea Guard to do a little something something against them. Dragon here does eat a couple axes to the face. And Imric, uh, for Imric, you probably want to just shut down the Marauder Great Weapons if you can. But overall, Pwn has not called anything in yet. I'm really curious what it's going to be. Um, maybe an elven mage. He Maybe he brought a big expensive kit or has him on some sort of a mount or something. But here comes the first breath attack from this dragon. And it's not a bad one. It does kind of torch down some of the marauders. Could have been slightly better if he was further back. It would have sprayed like down the line a little bit better. But overall, it's not terrible. Oh, wow. Okay, Swordmasters of Hoeth coming out. So we're getting some elite elven infantry rather than archers. Looks like he's going to be trying to brute force it. The only downside of that being is he's going to have to deal with the wrath of these Marauder Horsemen here. Those bad boys can do some good work, uh, especially two of them here. So yeah, there's two Marauder Horsemen. Imric's going to start taking some big damage. Hunter of Champions might go down here on uh, Imric to slow him down, make him take a little bit more damage. But Pwn's got to be careful with his big dragon. Certainly doesn't want to be taking all that kind of DPS. 
High ground fight is going to get liberated here by the Sun Dragon. Sun Dragon coming up to the hills, and that's probably going to give this fight up here to the elves. The Marauders here are going to get mulched by the dragon. Spearman should be able to hold adequately well, and Swordmasters of Hoeth moving towards the middle, but Pwn may have blundered here with Imric, getting a little bit too crunk. Granted, it looks like he opts to stay in fight for a second, going after Wolfric the Wanderer here. Rangers chopping into the Marauders, but they are going to get hit with a fat Searing Doom. A nice cast right there, and look at this. Imric is actually laying a bit of a whooping here on Wolfric. Wolfric is down to half health. Imric needs some milk right now. He needs some sort of a Mage of Life to pop out. And I would, I would bet money that that's what opponent's going to be up to here. But yeah, Emmerich does get uh, down to about 30-40%, but he does bring Wolfric down pretty low as well. So overall, not the worst fight in the world. And we do see the Mage of Life coming out now. Swordmasters in the middle, going to be butchering some of these infantry units. And the Dragon up here, trying to help win the fight. But it seems Leech Lord is pretty on point with these Horsemen and is going to be getting another Horseman out here. And overall, this fight will probably switch to Norska with the uh, prevalence of the Horsemen here. Back to the middle, Swordmasters of Hoth. Butchering the Marauders with Gary Opens, but still taking some losses in the process. Looks like there's going to be a fat regrowth going down. No, Plague of Rust actually going down here as the Elven Spears keep moving up. Skin Wolves being pushed back. Now Imric is going for the kill, baby. He gets a nice charge and is able to nail Wolfric the Wanderer. Uh-oh, Wolfric could be in danger here. There's probably going to be a regrowth going down and the Dragon Horn, the Vuvuzela of the Gods has been popped. And now Wolfric is on the run, being fully routed right here. He's going to be running for the hills. Well, not fully routed, actually just shaken, so... Emmerich is going to need to kind of get back right here, get away from those skin wolves, and uh, try and finish the job. Because if he could finish the job there, that'd be pretty big. Swordmasters doing some very solid work in the middle, able to cut up those Marauders. We'll see how Pwn's Micro is here. He needs to reroute them and get them to engage something else right now to make sure he's really maximizing his efficiency. Couple Spears holding valiantly here. I think the Sun Dragon should just cross a, a, over the map here and maybe come assist. And it looks like he is going to be going for it. Is he going to take the bait? Leech Lord's Lord here, very vulnerable. And I think Emmerich's going to go for it. Pwn smells blood in the water and is going to be taking the risk. And he does get the big hit. Wolfric might actually just straight up break here. Negative three. The dragon is on the hunt. He's doing the dreaded humping animation. He did get the damage then, though. So it seemed like he's still connected. And Emmerich has been connecting every single time. And Wolfric the Wanderer getting absolutely pounded right here by Emmerich. Brutal. And is he going to shatter? We'll find out. So here we have Skin Wolves with armor. I think he needs to get away right now. Imric needs to find a way to escape. He doesn't want to get surrounded by anti-large monsters and then have javelins thrown at him. But overall there, pretty good stuff indeed. Now over on objective number three, Norska holding it down with their Marauders. Mage of Life is nearby to provide a little bit of support. Over on the middle, the Swordmasters do take another good fight. And this is pretty cost effective for old Pwn here. Swordmasters will just annihilate Marauder Berserkers in combat. Berserkers don't really have good AP and these guys are rocking 90 armor and have almost 50 melee defense. So they're going to trade super well here, and the Berserkers are going to lose that fight, which is quite cost-effective. Dragon's still bouncing around. These Marauder Horsemen really kind of keeping him honest. I think Pwn needs to consolidate on two points before it's too late. Looks like he tried to get a Breath Attack there, which wasn't terrible. But I think coming down here with the Dragon would be uh, the way, and just securing the middle. A couple Silver Helms moving in, going to be getting a big Shock Charge into those Marauders. In the meantime, Wolfric is uh, back in the shadows. Imric able to get away from those Skin Wolves right there. And it's a pretty close game in terms of value. With healing taken into account, the value is probably really, really close. I do think that Norska is actually winning overall. They seem to be having a lot of nice little engagements like up here. It's going very well for them in the middle. It doesn't seem like the elves can get enough cap weight. Silverhelm's charging in, but they're going to get wrecked. Silverhelm's are going to get crushed here by the uh, combination of Norska and Hounds, Beast of Tashnar, and Skin Wolves, which are anti-large. That's going to be super devastating. So Silver and Guard trying to hold on to the point. Pwn really, really struggling on the objective game right now, but he is also behind on value as well. Emmerich coming back across with the Dragonhorn Pops. Going to be trying to descend on those Skin Wolves and get some good damage. And he might be able to. The problem is his Silverhelms could break. No, they're holding. Definitely sending Emmerich in there wouldn't be a bad idea. Swordmasters of Hoth taking down yet another unit. So they did take down those Berserkers up to about 1,200 value. They have paid for themselves. Now we're going to be getting War Lines of Crates coming out, which aren't a terrible anti-infantry unit. They could definitely do work. All right, Plague of Rust and Hunter of Champions active. Emmerich's armor is zero right now. So he's going to be super squishy against Marauder Horsemen. However, it doesn't look like he's being attacked too heavily. And man, Imric is such a raid boss of a character. He just moves in there and absolutely punishes all those skin wolves and gets terror routes. But there's more where that came from. As more skin wolves and the Beast of Tashnar do rally back here. The Lyrian Reaver archers can be used in melee if need be. They're certainly not bad in that situation. Spears holding on to the point. Swordmasters of Hoeth attacked by Norsk and Ice Wolves. But ironically, these 23 Swordmasters of Hoeth might actually put some hurt down on these... Uh, on the, oh, these are Ice Wolves. Never mind. So they're large. They're not infantry size. I thought they were the regular ones. So, man, going to be a little bit trickier there. Imric's still fighting over on the side against these Skin Wolves here. As far as these side objectives go, a couple Silverin and uh, Rangers are nearby, but it looks like the objective fighting isn't going in the way of the High Elves. High Elves are going to be uh, under a lot of pressure here very, very soon. The Sun Dragon's still battling up on the high ground point, finally able to route down these Marauders, it looks like. 
but the elves don't really have anything coming in to help capture this objective. No, you know, no white lines of Krace, no rangers, nothing like that. They're going to need a little bit of that. The valley is pretty close. A little bit of lead here for Norska, but again, high elves do have healing on uh, Imric, so that is going to be a huge amount of valley being recouped here. As Silverhelm's moving in, Reaver Archer still shooting. Nice little Sea Fang there. <laughs> Look at Imric, or Wolfric. There's all these Ricks in this game. It's getting a little bit confusing, but Wolfric's going to be unsummoned, so that means that the Norskans are going to be leaderless, but they won't be taking the penalty, so. Nice little tactical retreat right there as Emmerich is going to be looking to descend on the ranks. He really needs to break this open to get some objectives like ASAP. Losing out on these points is really going to bite him in the butt. Silverhelm's chasing down these beasts of Tashnar. And now we do get the Reaver Archers shooting into the Norskin Ice Wolves here. Is he going to find a way to get the middle objective? He does engage here. Goes after the Mage of Metal, but then instantly gets attacked by Armored Skin Wolves, which will do very well against him if he doesn't have support. The proper play for Pwn would be to grab these Reavers and reinforce. Get a rear charge on those Skin Wolves and try and force a leadership break. Uh, otherwise, you know, Emmerich will eventually win, but he's going to be taking a lot of damage in the process. So uh, points are looking pretty bleak for the High Elves right now, for sure. Norskin Infantry able to swarm all over the battlefield and up on the high ground. It looks like a good isolation here as the Skin Wolves do move in for Leech Lord. And those Skin Wolves going to be going after the Sun Dragon here. Sun Dragon going to get nibbled down. Its 70 armor will not save it from all those anti-large werewolf claws. Yeah, some uh, Lothern Seaguard would be pretty nice for sure. I think that would be a nice addition to the build, but it's kind of more of like a monster uh, infantry you know, focus build, which has been cool. But the Sun Dragon's going to be trying to retreat. Negative three leadership could just route off the battlefield right now. Looks like that is going to be the case. Middle objective is slowly flipping to the High Elves here, but um, it's not in a very expedient manner. Over on the other side, we do get the Reaver Archers engaging versus Marauder Horsemen, and they'll dominate Marauder Horsemen in combat. 32, 34, 28 against far lower stats, 28, 21. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, God, water went down the wrong pipe. Anakin, I'm too weak. Let me just have a, another sip here. Help me out. Hmm. But we do see the Skin Wolves with armor come in. <clears throat> and those bad boys are going to be uh, getting a nice surround. So at the end of the day, Pwn's going to be losing this engagement. He does call some Reavers over. Don't know if they're going to get there in time to make a big difference. But okay, he's got two Reavers coming in. <coughs> Anakin, help me. Too weak. Looks like the game is pretty much over, though. I don't see how Pwn's going to be able to get the objectives back. Even though Imric is just an absolute raid boss and he's certainly trying his best to carry this game. He's hitting at about 2,800 value, and he's paid for himself and done a little bit more. But the ground engagements for the elves just aren't going good. The second dragon doesn't feel like it's been super impactful. It's only got 600 value, as a matter of fact. So you're spending, you know, almost 1,500 gold for a dragon. That's going to be getting you 600 value, not really playing the objectives too well. Like, if this dragon had been, like, three spearmen or, like, two rangers and an archer or something, I feel like they could have been... Uh, a lot more impactful for sure. So Emmerich nibbling away. Armored Skin Wolves going to be chewing through him. It's been a good game though. Very good scrap. It kind of looked like the Hyles might have been able to cheese the Norskin Lord earlier in the game with Emmerich. And then maybe start to get a little bit of momentum there. And here on the uh, high ground objective or low ground objective, we do see the elves maybe wrestling this one. Objective number three is flipping, but Norska is going to be responding with some Berserkers. Emmerich going to be pulling back at this point. Mage of Life certainly wants to drop some fat heals on Emmerich if there are any left. The dragon up here just having a rough old time. He's uh, not been able to have a, have much success, especially with these skin wolves just kind of camping out. Elves might find a way to get two objectives, but the thing is, Norska can win comfortably with one objective, so they could just helms deep the high ground if they really, really want to here. So, Valyrian Neighbor is going to be moving in, and Imric uh, looking to do battle. Here he comes on his dragon. Going to be trying to get some big terror out. Some Marauder Horsemen might be able to finish him off, though. They are the Javelin variant, so they're not going to do super well against his armor, and hey, that wasn't a bad breath attack right there. Does take him down to about 70%. Looks like the Searing Doom from the Norskin. Searing Doom is a super underrated spell, by the way. If you guys are looking to use some nice bombardments against, like, Cathay, Dwarves, like, all these kind of missile-centric factions, Searing Doom is very, very good. Side objective, is it going to flip? Nope, it is not. The Berserkers do make it there in time. Marauder Berserkers are actually really quick. They have 37 speed, which is very fast. And the Elves here are going to be getting butchered on this point. They're just super tattered, very beat up. And the Silverins are very chad units, but... They're going to have a little bit of trouble holding against this Norskin Onslaught on the side point. And it looks like Professor Pwn is going to be getting, not shut out this game, but certainly is going to be taking a bit of a beating on the points. Even though the value trading is probably close, all things considered, or at least close-ish, uh, it is going to be GG Game Blouses as three points a second for Leech Lord. It's basically physically impossible here for old uh, Norska to get back on the board. There's, or excuse me, for the Hylves to get back on the board. There's not going to be any chance whatsoever. So GG, well played. Fun game too. Always love to see some dragons and some uh, Warhammer Vikings coming in here and partying. Beast of Tashnar moving up. More javelins, more great weapons. Very, very cheap swarmy type build. A lot of swarming. High Elves typically would probably perform well against this if they had like a battle line here with Silverance and Lothar and Seaguard and just kind of played these two objectives. I think Pwn might have tried to play all three objectives with High Elves. It's tough to do. 
Um, I guess you can. They have good mobility and good cavalry, but I think the swarming army is going to be a little bit better at that. So if Pwn had maybe just played two objectives uh, and had a more concentrated formation, kept his dragons together to get these big scary alpha strikes, I feel as if he could have won that game for sure. Well played to Leech Lord. He swarmed like a champ. GG to Pwn Dog. Always a mighty champion of the High Elves. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at the breakdown here. So Imric was a carry. 3,000. Spearmen did good. I mean, Silverins always do good. They're just a great unit. Fun to see Swordmasters in action too. And for the Norskins, probably not any one unit like got a ton of value. I would say their MVP probably were the Marauder Horsemen. He did a really good job parking behind the big monsters and poking them. So you can see 1,000 here, 900 here, uh, the ones in play, 1,300. So the Horsemen really were the hard carries in that first game there. So let's update the champion. The King is going to be, uh, we're just going to do for short, we're going to do Leech. And the score to beat is, uh, so that's his score there. And the score to beat is 1 on that side. And there you have it. All right. Well played, Pwn Dog. We have uh, Kareem in here. All right. So let me go ahead and roll this up. Kareem, I need you to listen to the stream because I don't know who you are in Discord. So I'm going to be announcing your faction in just a second. So hang tight. All right. So now we are going to roll the factions for these two players. GG, well played. Good game. All right. So this is for Kareem. I need you to uh, take notes here. Be listening, my friend. You are going to be playing. It looks like you want to play Vampire Coast, but we'll see what you get. Okay, you're going to be playing Grand Cathay, and Leech Lord is going to be playing. All right, the old wheel is spinning, baby. Yeah, Swordmasters are badass. They actually worked pretty well for Pwn, too. They killed a couple infantry pieces, so not bad at all. Uh, One sec. We're not doing mirror matches today because it's boring. It was a Cathay mirror match, so we're going to reroll that. Wolfric did take a little bit of a beating. It was confusing casting that game. There was a bunch of Rick at, Ricks on the field, right? We had Emmerich, Wolfric. All right, Tomb Kings. So, Leech Lord, you are going to be on the Tomb Kings, and uh, your opponent is going to be on Grand Cathay. So let me message that. Leech Lord, TK. He's Kathy. And uh, let me see if he is watching the stream and taking note. He is. Excellent. All right, Kareem, let's see what you got. And for the map, we are going to do the road to Talapheim. And there we go. All right. Outstanding. The map is set. Does Leech Lord want to use a reroll? He's going to take it. Cool. Tomb Kings versus Grand Cathay. Should be fun. We got Warhammer China versus Warhammer Egypt here. Should be a great duel. I suspect Screaming Skull Catapults for Leech Lord, but it's it's a little bit scarier now because Grand Cathay can go pretty hard in the paint with the Crow Men, so you can uh, you can get punished there for sure. <laughs> the did his elven wife who's proud. Oh, God. Oh, oh no. No. Matt says, I just watched the 1982 Conan was cracking up with the snake. Oh my God. The, the original Conan movies are so good. They're kind of like D and D movies in a way too. Like, especially Conan, the destroyer, they have like a perfectly balanced party composition. They have like a, well, they don't have a healer per se. They have Conan, the barbarian, they have the thief guy, they have the mage, and then they have the fighter, you know, they have, uh, they have the, the, the huge guy with the mace, how to sign up. It's first come first serve Grom Brindle. So all you got to do is just join dude. When a spot opens up in between games, you just fire it up and join. It's just it's just the Wild West. Will forever break my heart that Anticity has moved on from Warhammer. Oh, yeah. No, vampires Vampires are doing fine, Cooper. Um, you know, like they're not, they've been... There's factions that... there's They have a lot of bad matchups now. Um, like Cathay is really good against them. Kislev is, is pretty good against them. Uh, like I don't, I don't think like even if you took some of the best players in the world, like Houseplant, like I don't know if they could win major events using Vampire Coast. They're just not, they're not like terrible, but they're not like in the best spot. There's, there's certainly factions that are just very, very strong. Yeah. A lot of people have moved, you know, it's, we've been doing Warhammer here for what, seven years. There's been a lot of channels that have come and go for sure. In terms of multiplayer stuff, you know, most people don't, uh, don't stand the old test of time there. Move on. Stan, thank you for the 499. Hey man, hope all is well. Thanks for your content. Can't wait to sit here after work and watch some good stuff. Hell yeah, dude. Uh, Kislev isn't good against everyone. K like Kislev does have a couple matchups where they don't just like dominate. Um, I'm trying to think of like, let me see the stats. So if we go to Kislev, strangely enough, Kislev doesn't even have the highest win rate. Um, it seems that Kislev does kind of struggle against Skaven, Grand Cathay, Tomb Kings. Norska is actually good against them, apparently. Bretonia isn't bad against them. And for some godforsaken reason, Korn has a positive win rate against them, which I do not know what's going on with that. So... Yeah, like, they're really good, but they can lose. Like, that's like five or six bad matchups that I just mentioned right there. Um, and the Ogre Kingdoms, for example, have no bad matchups. Not a single one. 
Um, but again, I'm I'm banning Ogre Kingdoms from all my tournaments until CA fixes them. So because being immune to staggering and stun and knockdown is a massive DPS increase, it's it's basically cheating. So for me, ogres are banned from all my events in the immediate future. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, so are the players ready yet? It does not appear to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> see what I mean. that's shooting some funny messages in discord here so grand cafe here some great tools crowman i i don't know about kareem's skill level though this is going to be interesting leech lord i know is a is a solid tournament winning player um i don't know about kareem's skill level so this should be an interesting one we could see some big schemes but yeah i've been watching vids for years but don't often catch a stream thanks for all the entertainment keep it up hey i got you man i got you i think cafe kislev is like a 50 50 matchup i would say so yeah Grand Cathay can actually do pretty well against Kislev. They have a lot of solid tools. The Crowmen are really disruptive and uh, can, you know, even the Crowmen can intercept like things in the woods. Although things in the woods do have uh, anti-infantry, so probably not the best engagement for them. But yeah, they can really defend the backfield. It's all Ogre for the Ogres now. It is. It is. No Ogres means no Taco. Well, Taco hasn't really been playing anyway, so at least in the Dom tournaments. I don't know if he's playing Land Battle or something. I have no idea, to be honest. All right, so readying up here. Looks like Grand Cathay appears to be ready. Leech Lord also ready, I think. No, nope, looks like he's not quite ready yet. I thought I thought I saw that little check mark there, but I was wrong. Finally able to catch live. What a lovely evening. Yeah, all's good. All's good, man. Today we're having a bit more of a casual stream, an opportunity for players to join and just kind of try stuff out. We'll be back to tournaments uh, in the next few days. I don't know when, but I'm definitely going to do a... Uh, I want to do a standard tournament, like a standard bracketed single elimination tournament. I think that'd be fun. We've been doing a lot of Swiss, but I think having some best of threes, brackets, that, that would be fun to kind of get back to that. I just did like a bunch of SFTs in a row, so kind of uh, fiending to try something different here. Okay, no messages from the players. Looks like we're all good. See you later, John. Yeah, I'll let you. You got it. Where is the, uh, let me see here, where's the Mighty Falcon? Uh, he, I think he just kind of burned out on multiplayer. I think he plays casually with his friends on the side, but I, he's not like going to be competing in tournaments anytime soon, as far as I can tell. But yeah, Falcon definitely one of the best players of all time in this game. He's, he's, he is like, for me, one of the Warhammer 2 goats, you know? So far, I would say, you know, Warhammer 3 goat is probably Houseplant, honestly. Um, he's been, he's been really, really dominating. I mean, there's been a couple players who've come close to beating him in the most recent times. House Cat of War had an excellent 3-2 series against him in the World Championship. But House Plan has definitely been the Warhammer um, 3 GOAT so far. And, you know, then you, then you have, like, the John Jones type character. You have, like, Void Laws, right? Who was, like, could be in that category if he wasn't, like, caught cheating. So <laughs> there's, there's, like, there's that kind of stuff. <clears throat> the Swordmaster's value last game was 1,200. Yeah, it was 1,200. Hey, turn any update on a hobby painting? Yeah, so I've, I'm painting a Warriors of Chaos Army right now. So I'm just painting a bunch of Chaos Marauders, which is kind of, you know, not the most exciting thing to paint. What the hell is the, are these builds? Look at this. Meow Ying coming in with a bit of a meme build, but we'll see if it works well. Who's the Warhammer 1? Warhammer 1 multiplayer was like just the most haggard. Probably Onyage would be. Yeah. If you go on the website on Total Tavern, you can actually look at the Hall of Fame and see who the number one player is. So absolutely. Yes, yes. All right, guys. It's go time, baby. Meow Ying versus Setra the Imperishable. We have the double flyers. We have the double longbow riders with the Jolly Green Giant. This is a weird build, dude. Absolutely weird build. Yes, yes. Well, that was, uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll explain it really quick. So that was something that we were running into at the end of, uh, in Warhammer 2, when Total Tavern was out. Um, basically, how the system works is the top 16 players in the world get invited to a major tournament, which has, you know, usually $500 worth of prizes, maybe up to 1000 depending on, you know, sponsors and whatnot. And we were having people um, making multiple accounts. You know what I'm saying? Um, so they would, like, they were making multiple accounts on Total Tavern, and they were grinding them into top 16 spots by smurfing and uh, earning two spots in tournaments. And then they were basically playing in, with two positions in a big money tournament. So that was that was what we were running into. So, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a shame, you know. It didn't need to happen. They, were gonna, they had good chances of winning anyways, but, you know, just uh, the greed, the greed. All right, guys, we got Kareem over here, and he's going to be hiding in the bushes with his dreaded Longmail Legion. This is hilarious. So we got Jade Lancers, Righteous Lancers of Asian. So it's two Longmails, two Jade Lancers. Meow Ying does have Missile Mirror. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Earthblood and the Jolly Green Giant. I can't 
see this going well. Um, I feel like this build is not going to have much of a chance against uh, Old Leech Lord over here, but we'll find out. Now, looking here at the Tomb Kings, it's going to be a more standard army. Skeleton Warriors, backed up by Sutra the Imperishable on the Sphinx. Someone giving a speech right now. It sounds like Meow Ying's just kind of yelling angrily in the distance. But um, yeah, Sutra's a little bit vulnerable against like Iron Hill Gunners and Cannons and quite a bit of the stuff Cathay does very well. But he's not going to get punished for it this game. That would appear to uh, not be an issue. In the bushes, we do have a big force. Look at this. They're, why are they both hiding in the bushes like this? This is the weirdest shit ever, dude. Do they have like some sort of like weird agreement in Discord where they're both going to hide their armies in the trees? It's actually going to be a new Shopti rush, which I suppose isn't very normal. Um, Masu Shopti, as a matter of fact, it's going to be four of those bad boys with a couple spears. So I have no idea how this is going to go. Collins are going to be Jade Warriors and Jade Warriors. So we have double Jade Warrior uh, heading to the objective here, but they're going to need a little bit of support. The Jolly Green Giant's probably going to want to head out there to support that point. Otherwise, Cetra is just going to run them over on there and the Jade Warriors are going to pay the price. But what the hell? What is going on here, dude? This is the weirdest shit ever. Look at this. What the hell is this crap, dude? They're fighting in the bushes. God, this is so weird. How did they decide to just meet up in the tree line like this? I mean, I don't know how this fight goes. I would suspect the Tomb Kings win it because they have the spear support. But um, nonetheless, I guess we'll keep tabs on this. This is the weirdest thing. Okay, wait a second. Maybe Miao Ying, the Storm Dragon, is going to be coming over here. Okay. So here they come. Miao Ying could drop some big vortexes. Oh, she didn't bring Talons of the Night. That would have been devastating. Mass Carrion being called in and Cetra the Imperishable. Oh my goodness, look at this. That is a big Zerg coming into battle over here, guys. They're going to be swarming. <clears throat> Miao Ying has now landed, and we do see the Jolly Green Giant coming in to help. Miao Ying going to be going human form, probably to cast some Earth Bloods, I would imagine. But Carrion will be able to get a full surround on the Cathay forces, and that's going to be pretty devastating for their leadership. Pleasant Horseman being called in. And uh, I guess we're just, this This feels like an old land battle where two players just decided to camp in the bushes and don't want to move out. You know, this was very common in the olden days of land battle, land battles in one and two. You would have the dreaded tree camping. All right, guys. Um, so yeah, weird, weird fight in the trees. I can't help but think Leech Lord is going to have the advantage with all the spears that he does have here. And we do see some peasant horsemen trying their best to chase down these skeleton archers here. But I, I have a feeling, um, yeah, nothing was planned. Yeah, no, this is weird. Leech Lord's going to win this game because his opponent is not playing the objectives at all. Uh, all three objectives are going to be getting uh, given to the old Leech here. And I mean, if Leech Lord had a crushing victory in the trees, like maybe he would be able to then move on and sweep the objectives. But that's not the case from what I can tell. The Long Riders, which are staying on the ground and it's hilarious, are now moving out. Definitely could take down these carrion. Might as well take that free fight while you can. But the fight in the bushes uh, did favor the Tomb Kings, right? They had spears and they had a high armor with the Ushapti here, so that's going to be good. Two Jade Lancers basically just getting eviscerated, which is unfortunate. The value trading isn't, like, awful considering. If you look at the value trade, it's only 700 to about 2,000, so it's not, like, the worst trade in the world. But overall, um, this looks like just a bit of a mismatch here. Or, you know, someone playing an extreme meme build. Now he's going to be going for a bit of a gooning on such of the Imperishable. Here we go. Old Kareem's getting in there. And Cetra does get partially surrounded, but is going to be fine, especially with Necropolis Knights coming in. Oh, that's cool. We get the Snake Knight. So they're going to be surfing in on their surfboards, carrying surrounding from all directions. And this is probably going to be the end of the old uh, Grand Cathay champion. Yeah, his force is definitely going to take a big L here in these fight. These Necropolis Knights with Halberds will massacre these Longmore Riders. Carrion also surrounding them so they can't escape. Miao Ying trying her best. And Grand Cathay does pull a couple Jade Warriors onto the objective. And they have good cap weight compared to Skeletons. Skeletons only have 300 cap weight or three cap weight and the, um, or two, excuse me. And Jade Warriors have five. So it's a pretty substantial difference right there. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, big surround. Tomb King's getting the big bully beat down. The Jolly Green Giant's on his way over and he's a pretty respectable fighter. Yao Ying does go dragon form. She definitely should have brought Talents of the Night. That would have been pretty good. Looks like the Ushapti that did win to the bushes are now going to be descending on the Jade Warriors. So the Ushapti here are going to do some nasty, nasty work. And here it comes. They got their old, um, what are those weapons called that they're using? Are they like Kopeshes? Or uh, I can't quite remember the name, but they do get the beat down on these Jade Warriors. And here, yeah, that was a weird, this is one of the weirdest games I've casted in a while. Grand Cathay pretty much in shambles. A lot of their units running. Uh, it seems the Grand Cathay player is just desperately trying to kill Cetra, which, hey, you know what? If you're if you're desperate, go for the home run. You know, I, I, I'm all for it. But overall, it's going to be very tough. Cetra is very, very tanky and maneuverable, and he is going to be getting support from the Skeleton Horseman Archers. A little bit of DACA from downtown as these Skeleton Horseman Archers come in. Kind of an interesting choice. A normal... See, here's the thing. Normally, a Cathay army wouldn't really care about Skeleton Horseman Archers. They would be pretty subpar, as a matter of fact. But against this army comp, 
They have a little bit more utility for sure. It looks like they're trying to shoot the Jolly Green Giant right now. Longma Riders going after Setra again. And they do get a little engagement as the Tail Whip comes in from Yao Ying. She does some nice damage against Setra there. Another Tail Whip going to be popped right there. The objective going to be taken back by the Tomb Kings as you Shopti and the Skeletons able to swarm all over that objective, ladies and gentlemen. Jade Lancers, Desperation pushing one of the side points. And, you know, Jade Lancer could for sure crush the Skeleton Warrior in combat. Skeleton Warriors are pretty haggard, but... um. Even still, this is really just kind of everything that they have going on here. So Jolly Green Giant, they're just hunting, dude. They're going for blood. Yeah, they're hunting down the old Setra. I think he's going to live, though. He does have a Sneaky Snake Knights with uh, Jaff's Curse Blades on them, which is great. Gives him plus 16 bonus for large on top of what they already have. So the bonus for large while that's active is going to be pretty nuts. I don't know if it shows it in the tooltip, but yeah, it's uh, pretty savage indeed. Jade Warriors completely punished off. We do see the Lancers here going after Skeleton Warriors. And uh, Setra still getting hunted. Kareem's keeping the value somewhat close, all things considered. But we do see all three points in the clutches of the Tomb Kings here, and it is just going to be an absolute bully beat down here. The dreaded Bronzodia, yes. It was a fun It was a fun game, though. It was weird. Like, this fight in the trees, and they just both, like, accidentally stumbled into each other in the bushes and just took that fight. Um, but, yeah, no, there's not going to be a whole lot that could be done. Going back into human form, probably to cast the heal, is Miao Ying. What do you guys think about like characters that transform? Like Meow Ying type characters having capture weight when they transform. I always wondered about that. It'd probably be too hard for CA to program, but um, yeah, I don't know. Like if, if like a character that is like perpetually on a flying mount, they should, probably shouldn't have capture weight, but I always wondered about these characters that like can turn into dragons and turn back into human form or something, but it could be kind of an interesting thing, but probably not. It's probably not a good idea. Yeah, not much left, guys. Grand Cafe pretty much tabled off the battlefield. Um, we see a couple of Haggard units making their way in some Skeleton Spears and some Jade Lancers have survived some of the earlier engagements. The Jolly Green Giant basically just hunting down Cetra to the best of his ability. Cetra at 2800. But um, there's no way in hell. You can see here the Righteous Lances of Weijin getting beaten down. Jolly Green Giant coming in. Man, you don't realize how huge these things are. Look how giant the Green Guardian is. That man is ginormous. And a cannon called into the back. Cannon earlier would have been pretty good for sure. Cathay, I, I do think, has a, a decent matchup against Tomb Kings now. But if not, maybe favored. Although Screaming Skull Catapult Spam is very good. I think like getting a couple of those and just kind of working down very slow Cathay infantry is very, very uh, powerful. Cetra able to get away. Jolly Green Giant surrounded now by what appears to be Nehekar horsemen. So they are pretty resilient little light cavalry. Despite fighting a big monster, their leadership still holding there. And uh, they're just going to be poking the Jolly Green Giant. Points right now are eclipsing uh, 1,000. I wouldn't be surprised to see our, uh, our player here tap out. Kareem, you know, you went out like a champion. You brought a fun little meme build. Put some pressure on your opponent here. But at the end of the day, Leech Lord, is, he's not an easy foe. He's a tournament winner. He's a top-tier player. So if you're going to try and get him with these weird meme builds, it's, it's going to have to really, really be cleanly executed. You know, He's not going not gonna to do it. Yeah, we haven't seen Missile Mirror. Did he use Missile Mirror on some of these skeleton archers being terrible? Missile Mirror is such a bad spell. Honestly, Missile Mirror could be viable if they reduced its like Winds of Magic by like half. Yeah, if they made it cost like five or four, like a spell that you could spam because the counterplay for it is so easy. If you're paying attention and you see it, you just tell the unit to stop shooting. But if it was only four or five Winds of Magic, I could see Missile Mirror being used in a couple of matchups, which would be really cool, actually. I think that would be very, very fun. Uh, Crowmen can be dealt with with Tomb Kings by using Nehekar Horsemen. So if they like are diving your backfield, um, you can use horsemen, or you could just bring units that don't really care about Chromen, like Ushapti Grapos don't really care about them. Uh, and Skeleton Horsemen in these kind of numbers could screen out Chromen probably, like shoot them to pieces as they try and advance on you here. So Jolly Green Giants hanging in there, 900 points to the Ushapti pushing into the backfield, and uh, they are going to be butchering through these old Jade Lancers here, and probably reaching the Catapults. Peasant Long Spearmen will trade okay into Ushapti. Anti-large bonus will help, and I believe it's a pretty substantial one too. I think it's like 10 or something. Wow, 17, yeah. So those peasant long spears will get that bonus. Fire rain rockets are pretty good against Tomb Kings. They can definitely melt the infantry. So you can see a lot of the infantry are here starting to crumble, which is cool. So, you know, we're seeing some glimmers of a uh, of, of potential. Oh my god, is Setra gonna die? No way, dude. This is this is what Kareem wants. He wants it. He wants the prize, dude. He's coming for that Setra kill. Negative 18, Setra is gonna be crumbling right now. Miao Ying has been doing pretty well this game. You know, she's, she's gotten some whips. Only 500 value, I suppose, but the healing has been impactful. And the back spears grinding down the Ushapti. More Ushapti probably able to swarm over their spears. A little bit of lag going down here as the cannons and the old fire rain rockets keep just blasting away into these bad boys. Cetra crumbling down 200 HP. Cannonball's going for Cetra. And uh, you know what? He's going to get his consolation prize. Uh, Jade and Jet Lions are pretty awful. They need some big adjustments, as a matter of fact. Like, big, big adjustments. Those things are just absolutely trash. 
All right, down goes Setra the Imperishable, but it's not going to matter. Cathay basically spent the entire game trying to take down your man. But now we got 1,100 points on the board, and Garan Cathay is basically stuffed back. We're going to see the Ushapti Summon, which is going to shut down the Fire Rain Rockets and the basic cannon here. So, yeah, nothing left to really do. It's, it's basically just, like I said, it's been GG for a long time. Yao Ying surrounded by these haggard horsemen getting poked a little bit, and he's going to tap out. He got his prize, and he's going to leave. Well played, Kareem. Yeah, you played a high-level player. I don't know about your experience, but it was uh, it was cool having you there. Well played to Leech Lord, who is going to continue. We'll update the score. And GG, well played. All right. So, well played, Kareem. Next person can join. Oh, that was you. You went down swinging. You sure did, man. You took out you took out Cetra. You got your consolation prize. Happy to have you here, man. Hope to see you playing more. All right. We got Pink here. Pink is a, a pretty solid player. This should be a duel of fates. So we are going to roll the factions real quick. And here we go. All right. So rolling for pink. Pink is a Chaos Dwarf player. So are we going to get the Chowie? Oh, we almost got Chowie. It was so close. It's going to be Kislev for pink versus... That's pretty scary. Ogres are banned. We're not playing Ogres today. They're bullshit. So um, what's it going to be? Versus... Vampire counts. Okay, interesting. So Kislev versus count. So pink is going to be Kislev. And we are going to have vampire counts for leech, which I feel is a pretty hard one. They are Kislev. All right, so we're going to offer rerolls to the players. All right. So let us see what it's going to be. And for the map, we're going to do Gates of Ekrand. Map is set. And here we go. I know people get in pretty quick to these lobbies for sure. Glad to see you're doing King of the Hill again. These are fun, man. Yeah, I love King of the Hill streams. Very, very casual stuff. We just get to hang out and, uh, you know, life is good. Life is good. Yeah, I'm super excited for Age of Empires, by the way. Very excited for the upcoming expansion. I'm going to be doing a lot of tournaments for that, so... Reroll, please. Okay, I gotta wait to see if the other player wants to. Okay. Waiting for the reroll confirmations from both players. What's it gonna be? Kislev is pretty darn good here. I played Vampire Counts last night. I feel like they might have some teeth against Kislev, maybe. Some Vampire Teeth. Uh, yeah, Graveguard Great Elfins will be really, really stalwart for sure. But that hybrid shooting is gross. It's just filthy. It just can kill any of the monsters. How do you? How long do you plan on streaming? Not super long today. A um, couple hours, you know, until close to five my time. I got Commander Knight. So Kislev is going to stay. So we're just going to reroll Leech Lord here. Let's see if he gets punished for it. Let's see if he gets punished. All right, so we're reloading for Leech Lord. What's it going to be? I could show you guys the roll too. I should do that for the next one. Zinch. Okay. So we got Zinch versus Kislev. We have the DLC matchup, the dreaded uh, premium $25 DLC matchup. I can't seem to find the lobby. Uh, it's just called, you have to have the total tavern map pack installed, Ludovic. And uh, it's just called uh, T King of the Hill. All right. So we got Zinch versus Kislev here on the Gates of Ekron. Should be a fun one. Very scary stuff. What are we going to see for the Lord picks? Um, probably like, I don't know. The big birds are very vulnerable, but having a flying... The Chaos Lord on the disc, I think, is good here. Like just blue fire spam on... Like if, if you see Baba Yaga, Mother Stank, you need to you need to have something to snipe her because she's egregiously powerful. Like, she'll get, like, four or 5,000 value against you if you're not careful. So you need to have something to snipe Baba Yaga here. So I think for Leech Lord, it's a mandatory to have a uh, a flying caster with blue fire to really punish her. Commander Knight? Uh, Magic the Gathering Commander. Yeah, yeah. Playing some Magic cards tonight. I got four decks right now. Um, you guys, any of you guys play Magic Commander? We got a... Let me show you guys here real quick. I mean, I'm curious how many of you guys play. Let's do a little poll real quick and see. If the Hobbits were a faction, would you main it? Oh, probably not. I would play them for sure, but um, yeah. Wow, 
Okay, the numbers are a little bit erratic. They're jumping all over the place. It seems like a fair amount of you guys do, though. It's, it's, it's pretty fun. It's a great game. What decks am I running? I'll show you. I'll show you um, while we wait for the games to load here. So they're going to take a couple minutes to pick their army. So we have some time. Looks like a solid portion of you guys play Commander. Wow, that's... Yeah, Commander is the best way to play Magic. I agree. I, I've lost pretty much all interest in standard Magic. Um, granted, I do like drafting. Like a, like a limited and sealed events. Those are fun. Those are definitely fun. All right, so around 40% of you guys play. Yeah, Commander's great. So the decks I play, let me just go here real quick. Switch it on over. I play, um, this is my favorite deck. Yeah, this is my favorite deck, hands down. Braids, Arisen Nightmare. This deck is just so evil. It's so evil. I love it. So I play Braids. Um, she's really, really good. If you guys are looking for mono black, just like filthiness, like... It's, it's very powerful. Uh, so I play her and then I have for, uh, I have a super friends deck, which is Commodore Guff. So he's, he's just like Planeswalker, uh, mass board, like basically board wipe tribal with Planeswalkers. So, um, I have Commodore Guff and then the other deck I run is Xenagos. I think it's Xenagos. Yeah. This is one of my favorite decks also. Xenagos, God of uh, Rebels. He's crazy. You just double the power of creatures and give them haste. So you can be attacking with like 2020s. And uh, big, big creatures for sure. So you guys, him, and then um, and then I have the, uh, this is my last deck. I run Frodo and Sam. So I have four decks right now. But Frodo and Sam are very fun. Um, it, it, this is my more casual deck. It's just like a Hobbit tribal with like food, you know? So it's like when, if, if I get a little bit too sweaty with like braids and my Planeswalker deck, then I'll whip this one out like later on. Yeah, so that's pretty much what I run. Xenagos is brutal. Yeah, he's he's good, but you can be... Sometimes with Xenagos, you, you maybe take a player out and then you get, like, run off the board. It depends on the power of your playgroup. I don't own a Black Lotus, but I have a funny story about that. Uh, Templar Knight, thank you for the donation. You used to play Magic, but then everyone I'd play would have a... Oh, mill decks aren't even that good, dude. I mean, maybe in old standard Magic they could be, but, like, people disproportionately value mill. They're just like, when they get milled, they get irrationally angry, even if it's not a huge threat to them. Yeah, Gitrog Monster is great, dude. Would you build Abaddon? Uh, I could, but the mana base is expensive. I don't want to build too many more multicolored decks because getting those dual lands is uh, is expensive. I have a Zombie Vampire Urza Artifact. Yeah, Cali of the Vast is a really fun commander, Garrett. Really fun. How do you think... Oh, Slivers? Slivers are cool. Yeah, man, the original Sliver Queen is expensive. But here's the story. So I had a friend back in the 90s... Um, in the town I grew up in and he, he was older than me. So he was born, I believe in 1980 and I was born in 88. So, you know, when I was like, you know, eight years old, he was like 15, 16, somewhere in that range. So he owned an OG black Lotus. When he was a kid, he bought a pack, you know, in, in uh, wherever at the local game store. And he had an OG black Lotus. And this was like in the nineties. Right. But his, and then when he went to college, uh, his mom accidentally, like apparently it was in a deck box that was in like a pair of pants that he left at home and his mom threw them in the laundry and the black Lotus basically just got taken to taken to task in the laundry machine. Man, that is so rough. Those things are worth so much now. Like, uh, let's see what the black Lotus is. Uh, let's see. Black Lotus MTG. Yeah. $20,000 is one right here. Is that, is that legit? Oh my God. <laughs> Could have paid for your college. Yeah. Back in the day. It is back in the day, though, dude. Hey, Mazer, I'm glad to hear that, man. All right, so these players still haven't finished their armies. Hopefully that... Yeah, the classic story. I know. This story hurts my soul, dude. I know, I know. I had some really valuable cards, too, from the 90s. I remember getting scammed when I was a kid. I used to go to local game stores and draft when I was, like, 10, 11 years old, and there was some just, like, filthy neckbeards there who I remember, like, like ripped me off in trades. And now I realize it, but at the time I thought it was cool. They would trade me like just a brick full of rares that with like big scary monsters that were actually terrible for like valuable pieces, you know. How awful do you have to be, you know, to do that? And you just got to be an absolute just troll, dude. All right, Pink uh, is ready. All right, firing up the game right now, guys. Let's get it. Let's have some fun. Leech Lord says, I am so ready for bed. Hey, you you chose this fate, dude. Oh my God, no. And the Leech Lord, why are you doing this? You're, you're just... You better try and win with this build, though. Even though it's a meme, I want you to try and win. Don't just, like, throw the game. Oh. All right, guys. It is time. Let the Nerglings feast. Okay, so it's going to be Changeling. 
What is he going to be turning into? Can I actually check? Oh my god, no, this is so bad. Oh my god, dude. See, there's like memes that are fun and can still compete, and then there's memes like this that are just basically going to do nothing. Because he's turning the changeling into the blue scribes, which is going to do just, he's just going to run out of WAM and they're going to be useless. You could have at least gone like Scarbrand or something, or like, you know, Sigvald. I don't know. I don't know. No, it's, it looks like it's another one of the, uh, the blue scribes here. So, yeah, this is going to be brutal. Changeling and the blue scribes. Yeah, no, this is game over. Might as well just put a fork in this one because Pink's build is hyper competitive. And uh, the Zinch build is like just an absolute awful potato build. <laughs> you could just leave the game if you want, dude. Don't spare us this. This is just going to be a massacre. It's going to be over in a couple minutes. This, there's so many wasted funds here. The blue scribes are probably like could use a 700 gold cost reduction. And uh, the changeling, on the other hand, is, is just, uh, you know, obviously turning him into blue scribes. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be rough. It's going to be an absolute massacre. Favorite moment in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I love Deep Space Nine. I think that's my favorite Star Trek, honestly. I love Deep Space Nine. Joke's on you if he wins. There is no way in hell he's going to win. No chance. Absolutely zero chances. Like, the, the Kislev build is super tuned. It's like as sweaty of a build as you can possibly bring. And the Zinch build, on the other hand, is just an absolute potato. Absolute potato. So we'll see. We will see. So the blue scribes just cast random spells, but the, the you're limited based on your winds of magic, right? So they're, they're only going to be able to do so much. Dude, this is so bad. Oh God, it's going to be such a one-sided game. Well, at least it'll be over quick, hopefully. I've seen some other Ostankis in real life. I've seen some of them in Poland, and I've also seen some other Ostankis at the local swap meets. Do you guys know what a flea market is or a swap meet? It's like a... It's like a like an outdoor marketplace where people like just come like once a month and they sell various things. So they'll sell like antiques, old clothes. Sometimes they sell junk or like mechanical pieces. It's you will see the most creature of creature people at those places. And I've seen some other Ostankias there for sure at our local swap meet. Yeah, it's always a good time. <laughs> you think he's going to prolong it? I hope he just when he just gets absolutely crushed in the beginning by the Kislev army. I hope he just like taps out and just leaves. <laughs> so we don't have to watch him just get the points tick up for a couple of minutes. Oh my God. I thought about seeing if that was something we could add as like the total on total tavern map pack, like a, a God mode. So that when like a game is like super over, but somebody won't leave, like I can just click end game, <laughs> you know, I don't know. That'd be funny. Yeah. You guys know what that is. Yeah. You go there and buy old books for cheap for real. Oh, yeah, dude. I went to flea markets at least twice a month as a kid. Same. My mom used to drag me. Yeah, she loves them. The blue scribes will draw kite. Well, if this was land battle, you could draw kite. Absolutely. Um, granted, you know, they, they, they have their they have their player made rules for that stuff. Blue scribes plus the changeling turning into the blue scribes. And we do have the blue scribes here. Uh, you can't see the spells they get. They're going to get random stuff, which is pretty hilarious. But overall, chaos warriors moving over here. Chromatic abominations. And uh, yeah. All the resale dealers are cartoon characters. Dude, it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> we had um, one of my friends, my mom had a bunch of antiques and like junk and random things she wanted my friend and I to sell in college. So we went to the swap meet on her behalf. So it was my friend Paul and I. And we were sitting and, uh, and basically just peddling my mom's wares. And uh, we were trying to, we were trying to sell, like we had the weirdest things happen. Like there was one guy, we had um, like, it was a piece of a hose like a faucet head of a hose that we had priced at like 20 cents. And this guy rolls up and is haggling us. He's like, I'll give you 10 cents for it. You know? And we're like, dude, this guy's haggling over 10 cents. He's keeping it real here. Um, yeah. It's, it, I have a lot of stories from those swap meets. Cause I, I, we went to a bunch of those anyways, guys. Uh, yeah. So it's double blue scribe. This is going to be a masker. Pink, pink is probably, you know, happy to get the free win. Over here, we do have a couple of Cossars. Maybe again, actually, to Ambushers and Armored Cossars. It's going to be hustling up on the point. That's going to be some punishing damage. Chaos Warriors, of course, pretty resilient and will trade adequately well into the old Cossars. 9,000 HP plus the shields. Going to be making those bad boys pretty durable for sure. Yeah, no, this game is literally impossible to win. You could have the spirits of all the best players possess Leech Lord right now. and Because Pink is a good player. Like, Pink is a very, very strong player. 
uh, a couple seasons back, not this season, but previous, I think it was like two seasons ago, Pink was winning tournaments for sure. But this season, you probably haven't seen Pink winning any big tournaments because they've been playing pretty much Chaos Dwarves only. So that's a huge, huge handicap to have, right? Uh, all right, so move it in here. You have the Chromatic Abominations hustling up here and a couple Axina Ambushers back in the bushes. Mother Stank is being hunted by the dreaded double blue scribe squad, which, I mean, they could follow her and try and snipe her. Zinch doesn't even have anything protecting this objective here. There's a couple Zangors nearby, but they'll be taken down by those Kossars easily. So I guess Zinch is going to have to get lucky with his magic with the Changelings. I don't know. We'll see. This objective is going to be opening up here. Chromatic Abominations do have shields, and they uh, release some fire into the Armored Kossars here. Not bad. A little bit of damage going down, and Mother Sank using the Bear Launcher, but the Bear Launcher doesn't have tracking, so it's basically going to be uh, shooting at the last spot that the old Chaos Warriors were. So Blue Scribe sitting and using their missile attacks to try and snipe Mother Stank, and I guess it's better than nothing, that's for sure. Our little casket shot doing good work against the Warriors right there. Objective is going to be going to Zinch. Meanwhile, on the other side, we do have some Chariots coming out. So Chaos Chariots of Zinch, interesting. They don't have good AP is the only problem, so Kossars will probably be able to survive their wrath. And here, oh god. Oh god, we get the uh, we get the rotting Promethean summon. So remember, the blue scribes get random ass spells. So in this case, they're going to get the crab summons, and they do get it on top of the ambushers, which are going to be taking a beating for a while. You know, it's not the worst thing in the world. Mother Snake moving in, trying to get back towards the chromatic abominations. Definitely getting the abominations to start shooting at Mother Snake would be a very very good play indeed. And also, I think the Abomination should move up and start putting pressure on the Axina Ambushers. Chariot's coming, Zangor's coming. It looks like Kissel maneuvering a lot of their units across. The Chariots are waiting in the woods. They haven't moved out quite yet. Mother Stank's still getting shot, but she's going to start doing some massive damage. Now Kissel is going to be coming in with their uh, Kossify Dervishes and just the things in the woods. And it's going to be a mass route. Another spell going down here. Not sure what it's going to be. Oh my god, we get another, another, the Ghoulash. And another crab summon. So he got double rotting Prometheans back to back. That's actually really funny. So the rotting Prometheans going to be blocking up the things in the woods and the cavalry with relative effectiveness. But again, their killing power isn't great. However, this one is making some progress on the Axina ambushers. So they're going to fight a little bit longer. And down go the crabs. They don't last very long. That's for damn sure. Big shots from the armored Kossars here. Value trading is actually surprisingly even considering how terrible the Zinch build is. Just an atrocity. Chariot's doing a little bit of work, but certainly not having great success against the high mass jacked Kossars. And now the Wolf Hearts are going to pack trap them. Yeah, the pack trap is uh, on point now, and we do see the Chariots. Oh, the Chariots actually make their way into the Wolf Hearts here. If Zinch wins this game, that's going to be nuts. I mean, we would definitely just give Leech Lord, if he wins this, a total Tavern Icon. He can have the Blue Scribes. Uh, Flock of Doom going down here, able to tickle some of those Zangors right there. Not doing bad damage, but overall, we do see Kislev maintaining a rock-hard triple cap. His mother, Stank, basically folds up the Chaos Infantry like a piece of paper. You need more to keep Stank in check. You gotta have a lot of blue fire spam on her, because you can kill her pretty easily. And also use the Soul Grinder of Zinch to just throw javelins at her, and it's, um... Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So the Chariot's trying to grind through. A couple Zangors have made their way in. Screamer's very good against a lot of the mass. We do see Screamer's back here, chewing through the old Kossify Dervishes. Chaos Warriors are routed off. And do we see any split pushing? Nope. Kislev is literally fighting with like, like missing 2,000 gold worth of units with all those guys right there. And they're still winning this fight. They're still pushing back the Warriors of Chaos uh, pretty well. What does each have left in the blob? We got Screamers here. We do have a couple of Chaos Warriors trying their best. And uh, looks like the Bear Launcher is out. And it is going to be tagging the Zangors and doing some big damage, actually. But also does get some friendly fire on the Axian Ambushers. On this side, Zangor still pushing through, trying to hunt down the old wolf hearts while the chariots do get routed off. Chariots are pretty bad against Kislev in general because Kislev has a ton of quick mass that's very cost effective. So they're able to block up chariots and keep them uh, back. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bleak indeed. Pendulum going down from the old blue scribe. So the blue scribe sitting up in the sky, still uh, poking away. And we do see Mother Ostankia down to about uh, three quarters health. Yeah, she's about 60, 67, yeah, 60, 70 percent give or take, which isn't bad. A couple Furies going to be diving, but Kislev is an incredibly hard faction to dive because of the effectiveness of their cavalry. So Winged Lancer is coming out, and uh, yeah, these Furies should just retreat at this point. Otherwise, it's just free 500 value here for old Leech Lord, and you're going to be paying ye old troll toll. All right. So back we go. We do get the bombardment going down, and it does nail a lot of those armored Kossars here. Looking around the battlefield, the Chaos Chariots and the Screamers fighting desperately, but we do see the triple cap just being maintained. As the Zinch army ability does a little bit of work, but there's no pressure on the other objectives. And uh, Zinch is pretty much all in fighting here. And they're keeping the value close, but the problem is some of their units are so cost ineffective. The Blue Scribes are just so overpriced. They're so overpriced. 
again, they should cost like five, six hundred less. They're just disgustingly expensive. It's just really stupid. Armored Cossars duking it out here. We do get the Chaos Warriors with Zinch moving up and uh, some Zangors hustling up to the battlefield as well with Chariots coming back from the route here. And is that going to be... What wind spell is that going to be? That is going to be Scorch. So it looks like they had the Skaven Lore of Ruin and it does go through those units. I have to say, you know, it's, it's impressive how Zinch is managing to keep the value close against a hyper-competitive Kislev build with like an absolute meme build. But Zinch does actually have the tools to, uh, to kill to kill Kislev. It's, it's, it's a doable thing because you can really shut down Mother Stank. And you have some decent disruption tools and missile spells and AoEs to uh, also punish some of the backfield play. Screamers are pretty exceptional against Kissel of Cavalry, and Siege does have good infantry quality too, between their various warriors and Zangors and all that sort of good stuff like that. So yeah, double blue scribes. They have uh, they've tried, but this is basically just over. We see a couple Zinch units still fighting, some chariots here and there. Well, I should have accrued some respectable value, but the Winged Lancers were able to shut them down. It is going to be Zangors being called in, but it's not going to be enough stopping power. And uh, again, I wouldn't be surprised to see old Leech Lord leave the game here soon. I mean, there's look at this. There's literally Cossars just hanging AFK over here. These guys got the best job in all of Kislev. They're like, we don't have to fight Eldritch Demons from the warp? That's great. Let's just hang out on the other side and see how it goes. No, he's just messing around. It's probably because he's tired where he lives and he wanted to uh, basically just end it. Bit of a shame. You know, it is what it is. But um, the Blue Scribe's going to be uh, duking it out with Mother Ostankia. Trying to do glorious battle. And yeah, the Blue Scribe's the problem with that. Like, the, if the Winds of Magic wasn't a factor and you could get, like, a lot of magic, then yeah, you could uh, you could probably do pretty well for yourself with the double Blue Scribes if you had infinite Winds of Magic or something. But no, that's not the case. And we do see one of the Blue Scribes going down here. He's going to be crumbling. And uh, they have a pretty funny animation when they die. Oh, or they just... <laughs> they just disappear... What the hell was that? That was the weirdest shit. Usually they like have this animation where they disappear into the warp, but I guess it wasn't even uh, visible there. It just, it just, yeah, it wasn't a thing. Marauders being called in out of desperation. Blue Scribe still shooting away, and uh, he's summoning clan rats. Guys, we got Zinchi and clan rats now. So the clan rats going to be hunting down the old wolf hearts here, but yeah, they're not going to have too much success with that. More shooting up in the sky against the uh, changeling. It's going to be the Cossars with their pistols, and yeah, it's basically just Reaganomics at this point. It's just Zinch trickling in units. They're basically completely tabled uh, off units, right? They just have a couple of infantry coming in. They have like nothing left here, just this Haggard Lord up in the sky, which is going to be punished by hybrid shooting. And this is with them even even fighting, you know, without all this, right? Like these armored Kossars, like he's he has a lot of units that aren't even actively in combat. So he, the Zinch army was fighting with everything they had. And the Kislev army literally had like a 2,000 gold handicap and they still won the fight, like decisively. But that's because the blue scribes are just awful. Like, it's not, like, and he got the Changeling. So he paid 3,500 gold for an overpriced Blue Scribe unit. So he was playing massively behind with units on the battlefield. Goulash going down. A sniping attempt here on Mother Ostankia. And we do see the uh, Changeling going to go. What does he actually do when he goes down? Oh, okay. He was dodging some bullets. Is that a bullet hole in the back of him? Oh, man. Yeah, Blue Scribes need some cost adjustments. It'd be fun to see them in action. Not too much to say that game. It was a hyper-competitive build versus a meme game, so... Um, so the new king is going to be pink, and the score is going to be one. The score to beat is two. Well played, Leech Lord. It's a shame, man. <laughs> shame the blue scribes didn't work for you, but you know, no surprises there. All right, so let's do this. And next up, we are going to do let's do the Eastern Isle Colony here. Let's roll for the players. You guys want to see the uh, the faction selection? Let's do that. Let's let's whip it out for you here. All right, so this is for player one, which is going to be pink. And no repeats from the previous game. We can have repeats from the stream, but no repeats from the previous game. Yeah, no death animations there. Okay, Norska versus... What's it going to be for the opponent here? Find out today. All righty. I was excited to get greenskins there. Versus Zinch, so no repeats from the previous game. We're going to roll that again because we want to we want to mix it up and get some different matchups. And players can choose to re-roll too once they get their faction. So blue scribes are bad in general. They're, they're only good in campaign, really. Vampire counts. I actually have been enjoying vampire counts now that they're considered a bad faction. I'm all I'm all about that life, dude. All right. So Norse covers vampire counts. So pink Norse for you counts for them. And uh, I don't know if I have the information. Hey, uh, Counts versus their Norska. This is actually a fun matchup, I think. I've always enjoyed this one. All right, perfect. 
and we got Count Chocula versus Norska. Are we going to see any rerolls? I just think Norska is totally fine against Vampire Counts. You can you can do javelins and plenty of other things like that. Does anybody here follow land battle closely? How are how are Vampire Counts doing in land battle? I feel like they'll probably get crushed against some of the factions and like the fact that they can be kited by like some of these really strong new units. No, Vampire Counts are they're still fine, I think. Like I think they have some good matchups, but they really struggle against Cathay and uh and Kislev. And Zinch now too, I think, is a really good counter against them. I think there's like been a lot of factions that have kind of emerged with some of the updates that um now do well against them. So looks like we're gonna stay on this. Alright, so we got Count Chocula versus the um versus Norska here on Eastern Isle Colony. Grenade launchers on foot would be super cool. I think that I think uh I think a steam they should have a steam tank with with dwarven iron drakes inside shooting flames out of the side. Tier tier two according to human boy. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That is cool indeed. Uh Vampire Counts don't have the best win rate right now. Yeah, but I think they could climb back up if people started playing them. The like they they I feel like vampire counts are hard to beat for like newer players. They can be very overwhelming for like mid level players, but high level players seem to have their number pretty well. Made a tier list a couple days ago. For Dom, if you if you guys want to see a Dom tier list, we don't we don't need to do. We have the actual we have like the raw data. So if you guys want to see, you can basically just go to old Total Tavern here and look at the tier lists and just go to stats and you're gonna see who the best factions are. It's more or less accurate. Wood Elves is an interesting one. I think they it's only like one or two players. I think it's like Charix and Serkia who carry them. But um, you know, this is accurate. Ogres are the best. Greenskins, Lizardmen, and Beastmen are all top tier, very strong. Dwarves are good. Skaven Skaven are good because of power grab. When that gets changed, they'll probably go down to like 50%, which is fine. Kislev, uh, I'm not sure why they're not higher, but I suppose they do have a couple matchups that aren't the best for them. Look at Slanesh, by the way, guys. Sitting at 50%. Pretty crazy. Empire at 50. Dude, Empire is just always great. Always balanced. Um, Empire really only has two awful matchups, and those matchups are the um, Grand Cathay and Dwarves. Aside from and uh, Grand Cathay, Dwarves, and Kislev. Aside from those three factions, like Empire in the meta is pretty good. They can kind of go fist to cuffs with most factions. Coast is sitting at, yeah, 37%. They're not easy to play. Coast is not easy to play. Re regarding the issues with the Faction Wars format, why not split elimination phase? Yeah, so I am, for the Faction War format, I, I want to wait until probably 5.0 to do another big Faction War whenever the Thrones of Decay comes out, whatever that is. Um, because I want to wait for some of the big balancing changes to come through. I'm currently working on a balancing document for, for uh, multiplayer. And if some of those changes get executed and then Ogre Kingdoms get fixed, like then we can have a proper faction war. Because right now it's just kind of like, you know, there's a couple issues there. So just kind of waiting for everything to come together. Chorf seem like a nightmare for vampires. Oh, it's not as bad as you think. Because Chorf's really to cannot play against wide builds. So if you go super wide with vampire counts, like really thick and wide... You can really give the Chorfs a lot of trouble. If you just come in with like five Graveguard Great Weapons, Mass Skeletons, Zombies, and like Corpse Guards, just roll up on them and then spam Crypt Horrors from there, it can be really difficult for Chorfs to deal with that width. Like really difficult. Chorfs are great at sniping big targets with like Death Shrieks and some of the magic they have and stuff, but they struggle a lot against uh, against wide builds. Could Ogres be balanced if they had to pay the Greases tax? Uh, ogres just are bugged. That's straight up it. Like they're bugged. They have... Um, they're immune to knockdown and they, they don't be, get staggered in combat. So they just like never lack DPS. If you slam the heaviest mass cavalry into their faces, they'll just keep attacking you and won't get stunned for a second. Yeah, so it's it's pretty brutal. And on and on top of that, their units are undercosted. So it's not it's like multiple variables that need to be addressed. Yeah. How are the Dark Elves? Dark Elves are good. I think Dark Elves are like a mid-tier faction. I know in land battle, Dark Elves are very, very strong. But um, here they're like a mid-tier faction. Hmm. Is there any room for doing both domination and land battles in a faction tournament? I'm going to do both. Yeah, I'll probably do another land battle one. We'll feel it out. We'll feel it out. We will see how that goes. We will see. So for vampire counts against Norska, I mean, javelins are a bit disruptive. You can definitely just go like, you got the mortis engines are good, but they're also very vulnerable against javelin focus. So I think like you could run like double Necromancer and Corpse Guard and um, have the Forbidden Rods plus the, the Free Summon and then Zombie Summons and run Manfred von Baldstein would probably be what I would recommend. 
and just get the mass wins of magic builds. And then from there, you're just spamming zombie summons in their backfield while your Mortis Engine's like cackling. Yeah, and the fall damage bug too. Yeah, there's, I mean, Ogres are just such a problematic faction. They got so many issues. They are messed up. Thank you guys for joining today. It's been a fun one so far, ladies and gentlemen. We're on our, uh, what is this going to be? Our third game here? Fourth game. Fourth game today. It's good times. I don't think Hiles really need buffs, honestly. They're a pretty good, good, well-balanced faction. Like, you really just want to... I, I think you could buff the underused units on Elves. Like, some of the bad units they have could receive some buffs and bad lords, like Eltharian and uh, those guys. But I don't think, like, Elves are pretty good. All the Elf factions are above 50%, I think. Let's see what High Elves are at. Yeah, High Elves are doing fine. They're at like 48, 49%. So they're pretty much the same as the Empire. Do I have a favorite campaign? Yeah, I love the Empire campaign. It's so fun. Just playing against Carl Franz and fending off all the foul beasts of the darkness is always fun. It's a great time. Granted, I don't really play campaign anymore, so. Like, I like Total War for multiplayer. I feel like there's way better single player games to play. Like, I'd rather just play Baldur's Gate 3 or something like that if I want to play single player. Did Harry the Hammer is a hard counter? Uh... Harry is good, but he's all, he's very rarely seen. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Look at this Norskin build. Sign me up. So we got Heinrich Kemmler with double White King here, but are they going to have the mass to deal with this filthy, filthy monster build? <laughs> we got a War Shrine Mammoth double giant. Oh, yeah. And on this map, that's pretty good because they can just fight an objective one and just cackle. This is just going to be a disgusting blob fight, which is super fun. Oh, yeah, baby. Let's go. Let's party. Let's party indeed. Always buff Nurgle. Nurgle doesn't need too many buffs. Because here's the thing. Nurgle's going to get a DLC. And they if they get like a couple good units, they're going to be tyrants. Like absolute tyrants. So um, so yeah, that is going to be pretty crunk. Going to be pretty crazy. All right, guys. Here we are in the Eastern Isle Colony. It's a nice one. Very cool map. It's interesting because on the colony, you have cafe aesthetics, right? These are obviously cafe, right? And then on this side, you have um, what appears to be high elves. So... It kind of looks like an island that was kind of, you know, colonized by both Grand Cathay and the High Elves at one point. It was like an outpost of sorts. Out here, if we look out to the seas, you can see the Grand Cathay Navy. And is there an Elven Navy nearby? No, it looks like it's just Grand Cathay is the most recent visitors. With like this spine of like a great sea beast. Really cool aesthetics, man. Warhammer Universe is so rad. So, yeah, there you go. Always fun. Yeah, Harry is very overpriced. He, he certainly is. What kind of units will Nurgle get in the DLC? Uh, I think we're going to get... Like a Tamarcon would be my guess. I think, I mean, there's plenty of other Nurgle Lords you could add, but Tamarcon is the most hype in my opinion. He is so cool. It's like, it's so basically Tamarcon is a Nurgle parasite. It's like a worm and it, it has infested the brain of an ogre tyrant. So there's like a, an ogre tyrant who has been possessed by a Nurgle parasite. And then it, the ogre tyrant rides a toad dragon. So Tamarcon is a possessed ogre tyrant who rides a toad dragon. I mean, come on. And then you do a Toad Dragon, and then maybe it'd be cool to add some Plague Ogres. That would be really rad. If you got a couple Ogre units that were like plagued, like zombie kind of Plague Ogre type units, that'd be sick. Although I don't know if they'll do that. We'll see. I don't want to get more buggy units, so hopefully they'll fix Ogres before then. All right, guys, taking a look here at the... This is like old school vampire counts. Back in the days of land battle, you would often see builds like this, where Norska or these various you know monster factions would just bring a big monster Death Star and then try and fight the vampire counts on a blob. And uh, you know again the Mortis Engine isn't going to do much against it. So we have the War Shrine Mammoth, which does give the favors of the ruinous powers and uh, also does give physical resist to nearby units, and that builds up in intensity, which should be pretty easy killing vampire units to pop those. Yeah, and Pestigors, you're also good to get Pestigors, the 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 beast men that are uh, possessed by Nurgle, not possessed but afflicted by Nurgle. Throg in the back, so big monster Death Star. And the rest of the build is pretty simplistic. It's going to be basic marauders with javelins, and that appears to be it. With the fire sorcerer on the other side, burning head, excellent against vampire count blobs. Now, looking at the build here for Iskander, he's going to be coming in with fairly standard spear and grave guard, uh, great weapons in the back, very good against Norskin infantry. But he's really going to need to find a way to get some like uh, crypt horrors can do it. If you have crypt horrors plus like a dragon lord, you can definitely kill and isolate these big monsters, but. Looking at his build right now, I'm not seeing the big um, the big monsters. Or Yeah, like he's got obviously Heinrich, who can summon Krell. Krell is a great anti-large fighter, but he only lasts you know a short period of time. So I don't know if he's going to be able to do the job. I think he'd probably try and kill the Mammoth, but god damn, that thing has like 15,000 HP, dude. That is, uh, that is serious, serious HP on that bad boy. And the Giants themselves are rocking almost 13,000. 
Throg rocking about eight, so he is ready to party on the ground, and this is going to be some nastiness. Let us know your predictions. Vampire counts, of course, will have the capture weight advantage, so they'll probably be able to get the objectives. If you're vampire counts, I would probably recommend sending some Graveguard Great Opens and trying to triple press in this situation, knowing that you might not be able to win the monster fight here against these bad boys. I think that that could be pretty good indeed. Pretty good indeed. All right, so we do see the War Mammoth moving in with the big giants and Throg Daddy. The Vampire Count player try, probably trying to figure shit out right now. Like, oh God, what's happening? Dear God in heaven. So these bad boys are moving forward. Here they come, White King and White King. Skeleton Spearman hustling up. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the battle is on. I do think the deep press with this guy is a good idea. You could also reinforce with some Vargas. The thing about this build is, this build is going to be an unholy terror here. Unholy terror. Uh, to deal with in this one position. But they're not going to be able to play multiple positions too well. So Vampire Counts, I think, should take advantage of some of their mobile hitting power. Like get the the big like Vargeist in there with some dogs and you know maybe maybe some of that kind of funny business. Try and play the side point a little bit while just grinding against the monsters and keeping them occupied and minimizing how much damage that those bad boys can do. If you know what I'm saying. Here they come. The White Kings are on foot. They do, of course, hit pretty hard. Vikings have great combat stats. Of course, they are being buffed by the Unholy Lodestone right now and Bigger Mortis and all that stuff. But um, yeah, that's that's still like a really, really nice stat line. Colin here is going to be Marauder Champion, so the Elite Infantry. Vampire Counts usually, you know, Elite Infantry can work well against them. Heinrich Kemmler may be thinking about a split push right here as Norska is going to be chilling up on the point. So here they come. Javelins in the back. Very, very useful piece for taking down the old uh, Corpse Carts, but... Could be swarmed pretty easily by either fell bats or dogs, depending on what's nearby. Because Norska has invested so much in these big chunguses here that uh, they're not going to have as much width on the battlefield. So, Graveguard great opens chillum, and are the Vampire Counts going to be committing to this blob fight here? I actually like this idea, like sending the two White Kings over here to go play that back objective and just wear down these Marauders while the main force kind of just occupies them here. If you're Vampire Counts, you just want to make sure as little, like you, you want to blob as little as possible. Because if you blob too hard, it's going to let the Mammoth and the Giants really, really just club you. Take you to Pound Town. But tell me Mammoths aren't one of the coolest monsters in the game. Look at this thing. It's a, it's a tried and true classic. So we do see the Norskins taking these guys to task. Skeleton Spears getting some nice shanks with their anti-large attacks. And now Heinrich Kemmler, is he going to be dropping Krell? Looks like a zombie summon, so good cast here by a Skander. It's a really, really nice cast that's going to be tar pitting those Marauders. As the old Corpse Guard is moved up here. And Heinrich has not dropped Krell yet. Dropping Krell next to the Mammoth would be a, a smooth play for sure. White King's heading to the back point. Definitely a mistake to not send a couple infantry units up there and push. Okay, he's pushing right now. Because this this could be a losing fight. But if you could triple cap Norska and punish them for going super elite like this, then, you know, that's where you're really going to be shining. Have we seen Krell being called out yet? Not yet. So no Krell. Burning Head's going to be going down. Talk about cost effective. Oh, that's such an erect burning head. All those haggard chaff units just get roasted by that burning head. Talk about value city. So that's basically going to be crumbling like a lot of the vampire count chaff here. And this fight's looking pretty rough for the old count choculus. Although we do get some blood knights being called in. If blood knights can isolate any of those monsters in open field, they'll do well. But if they pile in it like into the blob and try and fight them while there's like chaff under them, it's not going to go super well. You need to isolate those bad boys in open field. So vampires are pressing this objective hard again. I think a bit of a mistake. The White Kings probably won't do too much here, although I guess they can start to work on the Giants. Who knows? Throg Daddy in the back. He's a little bit vulnerable to the Blood Knights, perhaps. The Blood Knights could come up and around and try and like pin in Throg like this. And the White Kings do move to the point, so the Vampires are going to be trying to play this one. As Marauder Horsemen do get called out for Norska, so there is a little bit of Javelin power. Zombies still the summons, I believe. Uh, no, just are they the basic variant? No, they're just the regular ones. And they're pushing back against these Javelins, keeping them at bay. Meanwhile, Blood Knights do go after Throg, but good awareness here from Pink. Pink is going to be pulling back Throg to make sure the Blood Knights aren't able to get it. And the two White Kings are actually trying to do battle, but the problem is the White Kings are going to get taken to Pound Town by that Mammoth. Usually they will. And these Graveguard Great Opens, unfortunately, are not being used in the most effective way. They're just going to be moving into Giants and things that are very good against them. And uh, yeah, overall, I think just pressing Objective 3, he probably would have had it by now. Are we going to see an objective theft going down from pink? That could be a very cheeky play, and that would be huge, huge punishment here. So right now we do see the horseman move again, but there's going to be a call into the dire pack. Dire pack is very good, and they will probably be able to chase these guys off. But you know, marauders coming up might actually be able to wrestle the point. We see the sternsman moving back that way, and now the big blob fight of blob fights is on. But like I said, blood knights like will do okay here. But like in in this big, they need to isolate an open field and take advantage of their shock damage. Like what I would have liked to have seen would have been blood knights moving up and over. 
and just hammering these shitty Marauders in the back point and then stealing it with some Graveguard Grey Opens while just sending Zombies and Skeletons to occupy this. Currently, the Vampire Counts do have a double cap, but eventually Norska is going to be able to outgrind this. And it looks like the Blood Knights are probably going to be going down here. Do they have any invos on them? So the Blood Knights at 36 models. Currently, their value is only 300 because a lot of their attacks are being kind of wasted and a lot of them aren't in combat. That's the issue with sending Blood Knights into a blob. Here we do get the double White Kings, which are actually doing reasonably well against the Norskin Giant. I mean, they still have almost 500 weapon strength. And, uh, oh, that's Krell also. Okay, so it was Krell is doing it. Oh, yeah, baby, let's go. It's old Krell Daddy. So Krell's going to be moving in with his big pimp axe, and he's going to be chopping away at that Norskin Giant. I was wondering what was going down there. Yeah, it looks like it was Krell doing most of the heavy lifting. And he has got a pretty long lifespan compared to most summons. You can see he's going to be lasting another two minutes here. Krell's only gotten 100 value so far, so maybe it was the White Kings. Now, as far as this side point goes, looks like Vampire Counts are going to hold it. Graveguard Great Opens have arrived. Skin Wolves maneuvering around the side of the formation. Burning Head does go down and helps to crumble a lot of the chaff units. White Kings and Krell still trying to beat down that Norskin Giant. He's still steady. Blood Knight's concave in. Definitely a big invo would be super welcome right here. Invo on those Blood Knights also topping off some of the uh, various Cryptors that are fighting. And now we do get some Devils coming in. So the Devils of Swords often are back. Here they come. They will be okay. They have good mass and good AP. I mean, they can definitely kill a Mammoth if they get a good surround on it. And it looks like Count Chocula might be starting to take this game over. We do see the Norskin Giant here getting taken down by Krell and the Blood Knights. So one of the Giants does fall to the Wrath of the uh, Vampires. Look at that. Krell's got his huge Battle Axe and his badass Mohawk. He's definitely doing some serious work. Those anti-large attacks are adding up against these Giants. Hardcore. Mammoth here, probably going to get attacked by the big uh, Devils. That would be a good call, I think, honestly. Just rear charging into the Mammoth. Getting a ton of armor-piercing shock damage. However, it does look like the Devils might have an idea of going after the Javelins. But, you know, got to be careful for the Beasts of uh, Tashinar here. These things are anti-large, and they can definitely chew down on these Vargeists. So they do land in the trees. Get a nice attack on the Marauder Hunter Javelins. Over on the other side, the Graveguard Great Weapons battling it out with the Marauders here. Over towards objective number one, we do see it being held by the Vampire Count. So the Vampire Count's definitely doing a lot better than I expected. I thought they would have more problems dealing with those big monsters, but it seems they've been able to get some good isolations. And Krell is still going hard in the paint. I mean, Krell's value is, let's see what it is. I can't quite check. It's hard to tell when the other things pop up. Only 300, but surprised. It seems like he's made better contact than that. So the other giant is being focused right now. The Devils of Swartz often are in the bushes and now have attacked these javelins here, but they are being nibbled down by the Beast of Tashnar. So this is a very cost-effective play for Pink. Pink is going to be getting all these Hound units with their anti-large attacks, just nibbling down these big uh, these big fell beasts. And those bad boys are going to be going down. Javelins are going to be back online. And overall, a bit of a throwaway here by Iskander on those guys. They could have made a big impact, potentially even killed this mammoth here if they had been used in the epicenter of combat. But now it's going to be a little bit trickier for them. On the back objective here, Graveguard Grey opens clear off Marauders. And uh, now would be a good time to maybe send some of those up to the point here. Maybe do a little bit of a tr triple pushing. Vampire Counts are a faction that does that well. They're really good at pushing all three objectives and pushing those bad boys down. Now, as far as this goes, we do see the Crypt Horrors battling against the War Shrine Mammoth. Beasts of Tashnar moving in. Their nibbling power will be helpful, but Spears are also coming into buffer and more Crypt Horrors as well. I think Vampire Counts have taken over this game. You have to remember, they have a ton of healing. The Corpse Guards passively heal, and so too does the Invocations and some of the other tricks and traps, and Crypt Horrors have passive healing. So overall, the Vampire Counts have a ton of healing on their roster, so they're able to cackle all the way to the bank. This objective is flipping a little bit, but we do get the Sternsman moving up. Sternsman, one of the most resilient infantry units in the entire game. Vampire Counts not opting to do a triple push. Rather, it looks like they're just going to be focusing on uh, the point here and just kind of playing that more simple style, which isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, but Norska's, uh, the cap weight's going back and forth here, but a huge amount of vampires are on their way in, guys. We do see the zombies and skeleton warriors and zombies. That's going to be eight capture weight arriving, which is, you know, and a lot of HP as well, so it's going to be tough to remove those bad boys. Here, the Norskin warhounds are broken. Heinrich Kemmler is back on the point, and oh, that's going to be a juicy burning head right there. Burn the heretics! And it looks like the Vampire Counts are going to be paying the troll toll there as they do get popped by that Burning Head. It will kill the zombies, not so much against the Grave Guard, but overall, it's doing its best. So, Vampires, are they going to maintain this one? It might be hard to get it back. Yes, the zombies arrive, and it looks like the Skeleton Warriors arrive as well. It is expendable capture weight, but it all adds up. And, of course, Heinrich Kemmler is sitting here cackling. It would be cool if Krell was, like, a unit you could bring if you brought Heinrich Kemmler as your lord. If it wasn't a summon, I think that'd be really cool. Like, Krell is locked in multiplayer screens unless you bring Heinrich Kemmler, and then you could bring him as a hero. I think that'd be way cooler for the Vampire Counts. I'm actually going to suggest that change and see if that's something we can get done, but 
Heinrich Kemmler on the run right now, and we do see the Graveguard Great Weapons move again. Norska looking like they may have run out of steam. They don't really have much fighting here. The two White Kings are just so durable and so annoying. The Mammoths should have probably made more of a concentrated effort. We do see a little bit of Benny Hilling as old Heinrich Kemmler rides around on his horse, and he is going to be dropping some zombie summons. Oh, that's a great one. So the zombies will be emerging from the earth. It's a pretty cool looking shot. Zombies crawling up from the depths and uh, going after the old uh, the old Marauder Horseman here. I, I think I'm actually going to make a Vampire Count army. So currently right now I have Empire. Warriors of Chaos are being worked on in tabletop. Um, next, And then Anna, my wife, is going to do Wood Elves. We have, we're have we outsourcing the Dark Elves to one of our mighty champions in Discord. And then I think a Vampire Count army would be good for like... A, yeah. I think it would be good for like an evil faction to play. Graveguard Great Weapons nibbling through these Marauders here. And we do see Throg the Troll King trying to stand. The objective on the backside does get ninja though. Wow, what a play. And now Norska is potentially back in the game with a play like that because the Vampire Counts are going to need some heavy uh, stopping card to get this one back. Definitely send some Graveguard over here. I did not notice a little ninja on the other side, ladies and gentlemen. So Norska doing it. And the call out is going to be a corpse cart in the Dire Pack. Don't know if that's going to be enough to win against these Marauders. Marauders, especially Norskan ones, are very resilient. They get the rage mechanics, so they get leadership, physical resist, and melee attack the longer they fight. So that's why Norska does have some of the best, uh, best Marauders in the game. But yeah, the Vampire Counts do win this blob pretty decisively. It looks like overall the forces of Norska are going to be routed here, but the Vampire Counts are going to have to figure out a way to get their objective back. Dire Pack does intercept the Beast of Tashnar, and uh, they're going to have a big anti-large doggy fight. Beast of Tashnar are pretty strong, but in the current state, they're going to get nibbled down. Corpse Cart moving up, and uh, more infantry need to be called in here. Heinrich Kemmler is moving over there to help out a little bit. Burning Head going to roast through a lot of the zombies, and it will do some okay damage. Maybe that was a misclick. It wasn't like the most... most impactful Burning Head. Could have gone through the ranks and probably done more, although okay, it does go down here and cook these guys too. Throg has also found a corpse cart, but it looks like he's slightly distracted, beating down some of the skeletons who are in critical binding right now. But Throg focusing down corpse carts wouldn't be bad. He's anti-large and is going to be very excellent against those bad boys. And now on the other side here, we do see Norska. Looks like Norska is going to be chilling out here. And uh, yes, they got that objective, man. They certainly do. Beast of Tashnar. Looks like they were routed. Dire Pack is going to be trying to fight this one through with the support of some zombies. Heinrich Kemmler summons in the corpse cart. So maybe they're going to be able to flip that objective back. Cryptor is being called in is a good play. I think Vampire Counts have a really firm stranglehold on objective one right now. Norska looks like they've been pretty much overwhelmed, although there are some AFK skin wolves in the bushes. I don't know why it just snapped to that unit. That was very weird. But we do have some AFK skin wolves in the trees here. Those bad boys definitely need to move out here and uh, move in. Maybe try and take down some Cryptors, provide a little bit of support. The Mammoth is back, dude. Look at it. Round two, baby. This mammoth didn't hear no bell, so it's coming in with uh, how much value? It got 1,100 in its first life, which isn't terrible. Throg taking out corpse carts is going to be mitigating some of the uh, you know long-term support and healing that the vampire counts have in this blob. But now the vampire counts are going to be resecuring objective number two here with the cryptors coming in. That is going to be a mass route of the Norskins. We didn't really have much stopping power there in the first place. Some skeleton warriors also going to be moving up. So now it really is just on the vampire counts to try and hold this point and on Norska to get it relatively soon. Norska is running out of time. They did have that double cap for a while, which helped get them back in the game, but they are really, really going to need to do this a little bit quicker here. So here comes the Mammoth. Going to start running it over. If it could snipe that White King, that would be smart. If you're the Norskin player, what you do right now is you just get you just get the War Shrine and you spam click on that White King, like as rock hard as you possibly can. So you just click on him, you make it work, and you live your best life. So looking around, Throg and the Marauders, a little bit of fighting power here. Uh-oh, Heinrich Kemmler gets attacked by the Skin Wolves, so he gets caught for a second. A bit of a slip-up, but a scanner does notice it and gets away. Could Norska be back in business here with this Mammoth, you know, taking down some of the characters? It looks like the White King might have actually died there. I think it did. I'm seeing a ton of crumbling. We do see another White King being called in from reserve. And now the Vampire Counts are going for a back push, which I think is smart, because they're hedging their bets. They could be losing this position here. I mean, yes, they could reinforce it, but um, it would take a little bit of time to get there, and certainly longer than just moving up to this home point. And this is going to make Norska like have to defend this point. Cryptors, of course, will butcher Marauders pretty easily in combat. And take a look here. Norska is starting to flip this one. Uh-oh, Heinrich Kemmler. He gets karate kicked by a giant troll. Only in Warhammer Fantasy, ladies and gentlemen. Dude, look at this troll. Throg's got a giant stone mace, and he like opts for a kick attack, which is just hilarious. Okay, there he goes. So he finally gets the mace, and uh, we are going to be seeing Heinrich Kemmler crumbling at negative 15 leadership. That could be a game-losing play. Because with Heinrich Kemmler being crumbled off the battlefield, guys, the leadership of the zombies and skeletons is going to be abysmal. So that was a huge blunder, as Throg is going to be coming in with the steel chair, most likely. And this could spell massive danger here, ladies and gentlemen, for the vampire counts. Heinrich Kemmler trying to get away, but he's for sure going to be diminishing. And Norska just takes over the objective. The giant and the mammoth returning. 
was able to do it. Man, I really thought the Vampire Counts had this one in the bag, but now it suddenly looks like it's GG. Looks like Pink picking off Heinrich Kemmler there. Pretty damn massive. I think Heinrich Kemmler falling and the Devils of Sports often being called in definitely was the point where the Vampire Counts lost a ton of momentum. But now I think Norsk has got this one, guys. They're going to take that objective and they can still win, I believe. Ooh, it's pretty close. It's almost single cap territory. Vampire Counts... Ooh, I think Vampire Counts actually will win on uh, just one. Yeah, so Vampire Counts anchor down on the back objective and Norska isn't able to wrestle that. That could be it. Because if they reach 1,250 points before Norska is able to reach 1,000, then that's indicative that you would win on one point. But it is going to be very, very close, man. So here are these Cryptors on the run. A couple Skeletons and the Corpse Guards trying to fight here, but the Norskan Barbarians should be able to handle them. And for the Vampire Counts, you just got to reinforce your back point with everything you got right now. It looks like it is going to be a, a triple cap situation. White King coming back here, and this is going to be an absolute Helm's Deep of a battle. As the Norskins need to, I don't know if he realizes this, he needs to just go over here with everything, dude. Just everything needs to beeline for that back objective and start grinding those bad boys down because it's going to, it's going to, those points are going to start going quicker than you would expect. For Vampire Counts, you need to get some good cap weight in. I mean, Skeleton Warriors are okay and everything, but you need to get some big, uh, big sauced infantry. Like some Graveguard Great Open. Sternsman coming out would be really nice for anchoring down on the back point here. A couple Skeleton Spears moving up. White King going to be hunting down the Mammoth. But um, yeah, they... Yep. And he's just he's just barely going to win it on one point. It would be a razor close game. Corpse Cart's on the way. Norska with its final push here. Vampire Count's already losing cap weight because some of their units did move off the objective here. So they need to make sure they don't do that too much. I think Norska should be able to find a way to do it though. Although we do have a lot of guys coming in, but they're mostly Chaff units which is just going to be massacred by this mammoth. Mammoths are really actually incredibly good at killing infantry. On a map like this, they can do the they can do the job for sure. Uh, king of the Hill is just changed by uh, if you just win. Yeah, you stay as the King of the Hill, and it's first come, first serve. So Vampire Counts anchoring on the objective. They do have the Marauder Horseman moving in. Norska basically sending everything onto the point. Corpse Guard's even retreating back, which is funny. And here comes the Giant as well. 1,300 points, guys. It's about 200 seconds left here until the... Uh, so uh, he's going to hold for three minutes. That's going to be a long, long three minutes here as the Norskan army continues to just pound through. A couple random skeleton spears on the back of the map. And do we have any good quality Collins? I think some Graveguard here for Iskander would be good, just to make sure he doesn't lose on the capture weight situation. Granted, Norska doesn't have a ton of infantry coming in. They do have Javelins poking Throg and the Mammoth, of course, doing very well. And this fight is going to be just razor, razor close here, ladies and gentlemen. Collins Graveguard Great Open is very smart. It's high capture weight and very durable and hard to remove. Heinrich Kemmler being gone, though, is a problem. A lot of the Vampire Count units, they have negative 10 leadership right now, probably. Yeah, for their Lord being dead. So that's a huge penalty to these already very low leadership zombies and skeletons and things like that. Mass Hounds being called on. Just speedy capture weight for Pink here. Going to be doing battle with these Skeleton Spears as the Mammoth just keeps rampaging through. And uh, yeah, Vampire Counts don't really have a whole lot here that's going to be able to fight these bad boys off. Blood Knights could be an interesting pick here, too. A Blood Knight unit coming in, providing four cap weight, you know, and uh, maybe putting some pressure on the Mammoth, but I don't think it would be the smartest. I think just spamming out high capture weight units is probably your best bet for the Vampire Counts. Norska is about to get 10 capture weight on this objective, though. This is going to be brutal when those bad boys arrive. Because these are Marauder Hunter Javelins. They, of course, are a range unit, but they're still infantry, so they have high cap weight. You're going to see this one start to flip pretty rapidly. Norska with some good interference here. We do see Pink using the Haggard Horseman to intercept the Graveguard. Every second these things are not running is a huge win. And now Norska's cap weight is going. It's flipping very, very quickly, ladies and gentlemen. And overall, the Horseman intercepting the Graveguard is such a good play. So those bad boys being held back is going to seal the deal. And that is GG well played. Norska is going to get it. Very, very close match. 1,400 here. But uh, man, what a nail biter of a game. That was a really fun one. One of the better games we've had today. Good back and forth. And at, at the end of the day, if Heinrich Kemmler had lived, I think that Vampire Counts win. I think that was the throw. Heinrich Kemmler going down like that, tanking the leadership of all these undead and also losing your magic and a lot of utility with his Chaos Tomb Blade, which of course heals your units, was enough to break the back here of these guys. So uh, looks like that is going to be a victory for Pink. Working hard, but well played to Iskander. That was a really, really fun game. I enjoyed the hell out of that one. And uh, overall, Throg the Troll King, fight or die, minions! Keeping all these bad boys fighting here in ye old pits. Alrighty. So, yep, just trying, but he surpassed in points. It's a triple cap. Iskander should probably just jump out at this point. I mean, he could do his ceremonial fight, but there's really not much to do here as uh, he has been passed in points and he's triple cap. So that is going to be it. Yeah, Vampire, it's way too late for them to even sneak an objective here. Um, he does have some spears idle in the back of the map, which is unfortunate, but... Yeah, Throg getting the pimp club on uh, your boy was, was a tough one. It was a very tough one. All right, so Pink is going to be going up 
to tie the most recent King of the Hill. So Pink is going to be the King of the Hill for now. Mammoth with 2,000. Giants, about 1,400. Some of them paid for themselves. Burning Heads were good. Throg with 3,000 value. Damn. Throg Daddy taking it back to the days of old. I mean, he's no mother of stock yet, but he's, he's trying his best. White Kings did really good. 1,500, 1,700 on those. Devils and Blood Knights. This was like the big momentum shift. When um, the Blood Knights and the Devils didn't do very well, I think that was when the momentum started to shift. GG, well played, man. That was a great game. <laughs> Are you guys calling him Throb the Troll King? I love that. It's pretty funny. Hey, well played. And we got the Love Guru in here. All right. So the Love Guru it is. So let's throw them on old Isle of the Forgotten Kings. It's a fun one. Let's do this and this. And what do we want to do? We did Road to Talheim. Let's do the Shambling Bog. It's not one that we get too often here. Yeah, Norsk is fun. They're a cool faction, man. All right. So let's do this. Let's go to our faction picker here. Thank you guys for joining. It's been a fun stream so far. Go into the old picks. So this is going to be for pink. No repeats from the previous game. Yeah, the Vampire Count Mobility could have hammered the side objectives for sure. There was a little things, but it was a good game. They both played well. They both played well. What's it going to be? Give us Nurgle. Ooh, Skaven. All right, so pink is going to be Skaven. And the opponent, the Love Guru. Isn't that, an, isn't that a really haggard Mike Myers movie? I think it is. Yeah, I, I should know this, but. Skaven versus uh, Zinch. All right, I'm down for that. It'd be fun. So let's see if they want to reroll. So pink, Skaven, you got Zinch, and Love Guru, um, you are going to be on Zinch here on the Shambling Bug. We're going to see if any rerolls want to be used. You need to message me in Discord if you want to use your rerolls. So please do that. Pink, the current king of the hill so far. All right, Skaven are going to keep it. Mike Myers, is he still around? Yeah, I think he's. I think he's still doing stuff, right? All right, both players opting to keep their builds. Cool. So for for Love Guru, what you do is you go super wide. You just go super wide. I think you just go mass marauders with uh, mass Zangors probably, and then you just swarm the battlefield. So basic marauders, Zangors, uh, screamers to probably deal with rat ogres, and um, honestly, there's a couple good lord options. Village isn't actually terrible here. You can go village on foot. Um, or a flying herald is good, you know, just for like harassing. Like the, uh, what's his called? What's his name? The, so the Chaos Sorcerer Lord on the disc to summon Chaos Spawn on top of like an artillery piece or weapons teams. There's there's plenty you can do here. He still does stuff, yeah. That's cool, man. I, I don't know. I haven't seen his movies in a while. Man, he, he definitely started making some really haggard movies after Austin Powers, like The Love Guru. And it's it's like Adam Sandler too. Like, don't, oh my God, I actually enjoy this movie, but I have a really low bar for enjoying movies. It's the, um, don't mess with the Zohan. <laughs> the movie's so stupid. Oh my God. Blue Scribes, no. I think, I think, I think uh, Love Guru is going to try and win here. You know, I think Love Guru wants blood, wants glory and the view of the dark gods. Sounds good. All right. So, yep. Love Guru is keeping Zinch outstanding and they're going to do it. Oh, you released a Netflix series last year, really? Huh, check that out. I will have to check that out, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Don't mess with the Zohan. You remember that movie? <laughs> yeah, that movie's so ridiculous. Thank you guys all for joining. Hopefully you don't mind the haggard uh, Zohan talks. Yeah, it's always fun. Is Kairos Healing Blob viable? Uh, yeah, it can be. Yeah, absolutely. It depends on the map Necromancer. Like in the matchup too, you know? Like sometimes going wide is better, but sometimes elite builds like on certain maps can be very devastating, you know? And it, there's so many variables to take into account. But yeah, Kairos plus like another big monster. Kairos is really good with the Mutalith Beast because he can heal it with a uh, regrowth, but Mutalith Beast is pretty terrible against Skaven because they're going to have a million little Night Runners and uh, Skaven Slave Slingers just killing it. And it's not going to be cost effective for you at all. And like Clan Rat Spears poking it, Rat Ogres pinning it down. It's uh, not going to be good, so... Not going to be a good time indeed. Okay, so Skaven. I'm going to take a quick peek at the builds real quick because I'm actually curious. All right, outstanding. And Zinch looks like they're moving and a grooving. I don't hate it. Both players have pretty cool builds, looking solid. And uh, yeah, we'll be firing this one up in just a second. We'll be firing it up in just a second. 
yeah, I think all the studios just started putting money in front of him. Yeah, that that was like there's like there was just like a torrent of really terrible Adam Sandler movies on uh, on Netflix. I think they must have had some sort of a deal with him. But like, what a great deal for Adam Sandler, right? He just gets to grab his like friends, you know, these like actors from the '90s, and just make like haggard movies and just laugh. And you know, that's uh, what a, what a great deal for him, right? Oh, I love Little Nicky. Little Nicky is one of my favorite Adam Sandler movies. <laughs> It's, it's, uh, I mean, I obviously love all the 90s ones like Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore and stuff. Those are just like all time classics. But, um, Little Nicky was one that was like right on the edge before he transformed into like Jack and Jill time era. Jack and Jill is probably one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It's, it's, it's an Adam Sandler movie. It is so horrible. It is so awful. But I mean, again, it's right up my alley. But <laughs> Little Nicky, I love the bulldog. Say it, Mr. Beefy. Yeah, it's so dumb. Uh, all right, so we got the rats on the Shambling Bog. This map is really good for artillery play. You can park your artillery pretty safely around that little alcove and get some nice shots, so it's very, very fun. I want to get in on this. Yeah, man, come join the party. Oh, man, I love Wedding Singer. Wedding Singer is a good movie, too. Wedding Singer is great. Longest Yard was really good. Yeah, I agree. I love Longest Yard. <laughs> yeah, this is, there's some, those are some gems for sure. Yeah, that era had some fun movies. Like Joe Dirt was another one of my all-time favorites. I know that's not Adam Sandler, but it's uh, it's a really good one. Yeah, Joe Dirt's a classic. Yeah, if it, you know, Adam Sandler had some weird movies. Like, yeah, like Fifty First Dates. And uh, I think the other one's called Click. It's like the one where he, he like fast forwards his life with the remote controller. Those movies are like super sad. I was like shocked. I remember like going to those when they came out being, oh, it's going to be a funny Adam Sandler movie. And then you're like, whoa, this is like, yeah, Mr. Deeds, yeah. Yeah, then you're just like, yeah. Yeah, those movies are heavy, man. Uncut Gems, yeah, I saw that. I saw that, it was a good one. What the hell is this? Are we going to see a Skaven build without unsummoning? Oh, I love it. Planning for the future, because that will, that the, the time of the Skaven doing that is, uh, you know, potentially going to be running into some issues soon. You're my boy, Blue. Yeah, old school is great. Early 2000s had a lot of good comedy. Like late late 90s, early 2000s. It was, it was a, I would say a golden age for comedy, you know? Like we don't really get good comedy anymore. Um, I mean, occasionally you'll get like a comedy sh movie or something, but usually they're just very uh, reined in, you know? They're not like, they don't really, yeah. They, I don't know. They just don't do it. Which is a shame, you know? Which is a shame. I basically am Joe Dirt. It's true. <laughs> When they, when like Joe Dirt thinks he finds like that like treasure that fell out of a plane, but it's actually just like a, like a port, it like it's just like waste from the plane. Oh God. All right, taking a look here at the Skaven build. It's going to be a gray seer of ruin. And I have to say, this is great to see, seeing an actual Skaven Lord being used. So we do see Warp Lightning, which is a good spell. And the dreaded 13th spell, it is extremely dreaded. So this thing does a ton of damage and summons a unit of Storm Vermin, which I love. Double Plague Claw Catapult's going to be hiding in the bushes. And the Plague Claw Catapult's will be nice for popping out and putting some big firepower on the more tanky Zinch infantry. And yeah, the rats are basically just going to be swarming. It's a hell of a lot of clan rats with the Grey Seer, Double Catapult's, and Poison Wind Globideers. Going to be trying to saturate and stop the front line from getting too crazy. And Pink is also going to be pushing Objective 3 with a fair amount of clan rats and Skaven Slaves. So overall, the time is now. Now, as far as this objective goes, or this side, I should say, the dreaded love guru. Chaos Sorcerer Lord, Pinkfire, a very good choice. Pinkfire is excellent at clearing out clan rats. Infernal Gateway is probably a little bit of overkill against Gaven. I don't think you need big expensive Vortexes. It's more cost effective to just spam Pinkfire. But in the situation this Gaven do blob too many units, having the Vortex, I suppose, as a contingency isn't necessarily a terrible idea. So Sword of Change is also very good because what can be done is this uh, Chaos Sorcerer Lord can maneuver like over the train here and if there's no rattling gunners, could go straight for those catapults and summon chaos spawn on top of them, which could be uh, which could be very fun. Marauders of Zinch in the front, severed claw, always a good choice. Very annoying for Skaven to kill. Aeacol Hell Hellbrass. So this is going to make the old Zinch forces very tough to deal with on this point, right? You get Aeacol and you get severed claw sitting on objective number two right here, and that is going to be a pain in the ass to move them off. And then you just defend your home objective against Skaven split pushing, and I think you're going to be okay. Oh my god, you guys talking about Mystery Men? Jesus, that was with Ben Stiller. And oh, yeah, that's that's old school, dude. That's old school. That's just some, those are some good times. So the battle soon to be on here on the Shambling Bog. This is one of our new Total Tavern map pack maps. 
I love Shambling Bog. I think it's very, very fun. And uh, yeah, always makes for some good battles indeed. A Chaos Sorcerer Lord sitting on his disc, surfing about. They're so rad. Man, Zinch characters are really cool. I think of uh, all the different Chaos Gods. Nurgle is obviously my favorite, but it's tough. I mean, I like Corn a lot, but Zinch, Zinch's aesthetic is really rad. Like kind of the prismatic colors and all those different things like that. And kind of the HP Lovecraft influence on Zinch. I like that a lot too. Like these like just warped monstrosities and different things like that. I think it makes for a, a good time. So a couple of Marauder Horsemen coming out, but they are getting hit hard by those catapults. But able to dodge a couple of those shots, and the shields do absorb the initial volley. Skaven with just an absolute torrent of units. Big shout out to Pink here for playing Skaven uh, without the Haggard power grab. Catapults? Yep, nuking in. Those Marauder Horsemen still confident, but not for long. Now they're shaking. Chaos Sorcerer Lord's going for it. So what needs to be done for the Skaven right now is they need to summon out Rattling Gunners and have a Howling Warp Gale. Otherwise, you know, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord's just going to get back here and he's going to summon some Chaos Spawn on top of the Catapults and you're just going to lose a Catapult outright for a summon. So that would not be good at all. But so far the Catapult's doing good work and Pink Fire being used by the Love Guru. So that was a big mistake. Uh, might be a little bit newer, I'm not sure. The build for Love Guru is good, but that execution, uh, overall, the Pink Fire is only really good against like Clan Rats. You, you don't want to be using it against low model count units, otherwise it really just won't do much damage. So Pink is moving up, and we do see the Rat Hordes getting ready to party. And overall, here on the far side, Marauder Horseman still bouncing around, but Zinch is going to be anchoring down on the objective, and the Skaven are going to have to remove them with some Brute Force, but they have a hell of a lot of units. I mean, the Skaven could potentially swarm the back objective for Zinch. Also a bit of a misplay here. Zinch needs to get that point. You need to get some dudes over towards objective one and grab that if they can. The dreaded 13th spell will come soon, but those Catapults, man, doing big work. Warp Lightning also going down, absolutely nuking those Marauders. Quite a bit of work. So here comes the Clash in the front. The dreaded 13th spell is in the back pocket. You're going to want to save that for some Armored Troopers if you can. Objective's going to be opening up here in about 10 seconds, give or take. So we do see 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the rats do have 5, 10 to capture weight here, plus 2 expendable units. That's going to be 14 capture weight on that objective, and they should be laughing all the way to the bank. Pink also getting some nice volley fire here. Globadiers, even though they did get nerfed, still do some okay damage, and they are throwing their fat hand grenades into the old Marauders in the front. So those damage over time effects are going to start saturating in. And though the rats are going to be, you know, not starting with objective number two, it shouldn't be too hard for them to get this if Zinch just kind of keeps taking this pounding like this. And man, oh man, they are getting absolutely nailed by those guys. Absolutely nailed indeed. So side objective, it looks like it's going to go to the rats. The clan rat's going to anchor that one down. Chaos Sorcerer Lord getting a little bit crazy here. Not sure what he's up to, but this would be a good opportunity to get a pink fire, like an overcasted one, like right down the line. You'd hit both those units. But this isn't a bad cast either. It does hit two clan rat units and also goes back and hits that other clan rat. So that was a that was a much better cast than the first one, which was clearly a mistake. But the Skaven Catapult's doing brutal damage. Oh my god, it's triple plague claw catapult! They're just terrorizing the Zinch army, and there's no furies or nothing really trying to disrupt them. Looks like Zinch is gonna be calling in Chaos Knights. That's very Chad, but I don't think the Chaos Knights are going to save you against his massive horde of rats, which are just absolutely plowing through the Zinch army. So Zinch does have its Chaos Sorcerer Lord. Catapult still raining fire. Very accurate shot. Those clan rats must have had some family in this one. They did not hit any of their friendly rats. But yeah, overall, I think Zinch is going to get value traded pretty damn hard here. We see them getting folded back like a piece of paper. Globadiers throwing into the old aspiring champions, the Severed Claw here. So they're going to be a tough one to drag down. But now it looks like the rats will probably find their way over towards objective number one as more and more units do come in here. We do see Furies and the Chaos Knights moving. And for some reason, I mean, is the value difference really that bleak? It might be, actually. Yeah, it doesn't look like Zinch is getting much value at all in most of these trades. And those Catapults, man, are just uh, raining, just steaming hot Warp Lightning. And shout out to Pink again for using the Alpha Skaven play without using the Unsummoned. Death Globe Bombardier is called in. Death Globe should be able to kill Severed Claw. They hit very, very hard and have super big AP value, so Severed Claw might get melted. Aikold's just kind of standing there, confused, trying to figure out what he wants to do with his life. I wouldn't hate to see the Chaos Knights moving back here, and now we do get some Furies and Screamers going, so that's good. So yeah, finally, good shutdown here by Love Guru. So Love Guru calls in some Chaos Spawn with the old Chaos Sorcerer Lord. Does get the Catapults offline, but the Rats are going to flee back into the trees. The other Sorcerer is trying to shut down this Catapult here, and it looks like Furies have gotten this side down. So this is the start of some... Good engagements here for the old Love Guru. These Play Claw Catapults going offline is going to be really big. And it looks like the Skaven don't really have adequate tools to uh, protect them in the back. Wolf Rats would be the preferred way. Wolf Rats and Rat Ogres would be usually your defensive tools in the backfield here. And it looks like they're going to be trying, but that Play Claw Catapult's going to be offline. The other one's going to stabilize, but the Chaos Sorcerer Lord is shutting them down. So Zinch is getting like a moment of reprieve for now. But the Skaven Lord is hustling up and... Uh, is that my game sound off? Let me see. Hold on. No, it's not. Okay, cool. I was like, oh, wait a second. We need to hear the glorious sounds of combat. 
But yeah, the Rat Lord might be able to help push here, and also some Clan Rats with Shield. Zinch is uh, pretty massively behind in value. Granted, shutting down the Catapults was a, a good play. And the thing about Screamers is, Screamers will trade very well into Rat Ogres, so the Screamer Fury composition here isn't terrible. Might actually be able to get some decent trading. One Catapult is uh, still firing, and the other one's going to come back online. Pink does a good job of calling out Rat Ogres to secure this one, so the Chaos Spawn... Uh, are of course unbreakable, but they're going to be diminishing here in a second with only 70 HP. This catapult should be back online relatively soon. So Zinch still managing to hold on to the middle objective. Impressive stuff. Severed Claw being a menace, and it looks like some of the Globadier units were forced back. So the Chaos Knights have been able to break through the lines, and wow, could we see a reverse in momentum? It was looking so bleak here for the old uh, forces of the Changer, but now, I mean, if these... No, 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 no! Don't lo Those Chaos Knights need to stay here. Those Chaos Knights need to massacre those Globadiers. That is a big, big power play, but it looks like they're going to be pulling back to the objective, maybe. I'm not sure. So that was a big blunder. Those Chaos Knights should have stayed on top of the Globadiers and uh, just massacred them. That was a ton of free value right there, but now they just literally let the Globadiers just pound them, and they're going to be taking some heavy damage. Zinch maybe desperately trying to hold on to the objective, but those Globes doing big, big work. The Ratmaster coming here. Is that going to be the dreaded 13 spell? Like a misclick? Just casting it all the way over there? Because normally you would want to cast it on like the, the spot where they're going to be because it does damage, but I suppose not. So Storm Vermin being called. The dreaded 13 spell is upon us and the rats get their halberds out. They're moving up and pushing back the forces of the Changer as the Mighty Bell does swing. Dude, that's a cool shot. Look at the big Sylvanian castle with like the Skaven emerging and the bell. Oh, the, that's, that's just like what Warhammer is right there. That's beautiful stuff, so... Unholy Clamor also going down. Skaven gets 16 leadership across the board, and the back objective is probably going to be flipping to them. Zincha has lost pretty much all three of the objectives. They're pretty darn behind on value right now. We do see another pink fire going down. Going to be nailing some of those clan rat spears. Catapult crew on the way back in. The Screamer's finally going to be dragged down by just a horde of rats. Just a million little rat boys. And uh, some Marauder Horsemen actually do manage to slip around. So it looks like they found a way through the backfield here, and those Blade Claw catapults are going to go. Chaos yeah, Sorcerer Lord, some nice disruption, trying to shut down the Plague Claw Catapults, but probably not going to have too much success here. As we look at objective number two, the rats do have it in their little uh, rat paws, and they have a plenty of clan rats holding onto that. Severed Claw and Zangors trying to get their way back through, but the Rat Ogres and the Death Glow Bombardiers are going to be enough to probably punish most of those. And that was a big misplay. The Chaos Knights definitely should have killed those. Uh, that would have been, a, I don't know if it would have been enough to get them back in the game, but it would have made a big difference for sure. So back here, clan rats, clan rats. A lot of unsummons need to be done for this game, and otherwise you can run out of units. Zinch army ability going down here for the Love Guru. So Love Guru trying to clean off the back objective. Not a terrible cast, and uh, it will clear off quite a few of the clan rats. If you cast it in the center of the two, it would have done a little bit more collateral damage to both. But that will give Zinch some tools to move some infantry onto that point and maybe get it back. So unsummons going down. Definitely got to do some proper housekeeping. Looking at objective number two, we do see the rats holding onto it. Uh, Severed Claw still very much alive, though. Death Glow Bombardier is going to be trying to wear them down if they can. And it looks like all three catapults were stabilized, which is bleak. Um, one, two, and three. Although that Chaos Sorcerer Lord is causing quite a bit of disruption here on his little disc. He's very tanky. I mean, Chaos Sorcerers have high armor, so yeah, really nice cast right there. That was a good one. The, uh, the old pink fire going down the spear line. Always welcome. But the triple cap's going to be tough to break, especially since Gaven are pretty well ahead on value. Uh, the Chaos Knights, I believe, have been broken. Yeah, they've been broken, but could come back in here and get some freebies if they want to. So having the Chaos Knights come and attack these Death Glow Bombardiers could be very, very good. And uh, something that should have been done earlier for sure. St. Blackwater, thank you for the 10. Yo, T, loving the format of this map. Shout out to the Maker. It's gorgeous. Hope to see it more. I love this map too. There's, there's some players who don't like it because of how easy artillery can be played here, but... I like to have maps that encourage different play styles, you know, and even even if artillery is really strong in this map, that's okay. It's part of the meta. You can pick and ban for it, right? So Death Glow Bombardiers doing good work, nuking away into these bad boys. Horsemen moving up, but Ogres are here. Zeech starting to get a little bit of capture weight on this objective with their old Severed Claw, but the Severed Claw is just getting Death Globes so hard. These Death Globes probably at 1,000 plus value, almost 2,000. So yeah, I think Death Globes will be a very pertinent part of the Skaven future with how good they are at killing infantry and a little bit expensive, but overall, I still think they do good work. So the rats firmly in control of objective one, objective three in their clutches. They do have a couple clan rats that are going to move up and secure that. Middle objective, it looks like Zeech is trying their best to wrestle this one back, but the Rattos just have so much stuff, and uh, I think everything here is just going to get cleared out. You can see a mass exodus of Zeechian forces as more marauders come in, and uh, the Death Globe Bombardiers eclipsing 200 value here, or 2,000 value, which is just nuts. And these Death Globes get called in, take down those Zangors in the back. And the old Love Guru might be running out of steam here, guys. He's got a 4,000 value deficit. Zinchian Shield's healing is something to be considered. Skaven just barely holding on to this one. But is the Skaven Lord going to make the difference here? We'll find out. 
Clan rats and ogres up on the point, and uh, yeah, looks like it is all going to be stable for now as Globadiers get a huge shout, but look at that volley! It's absolutely punishing. That's going to be a Zinch single target army ability going down to the Grace here, so the Grace here is going to get blasted in the face with that. So there it goes, and he does dodge it. They have weird attack animations where they kind of like sway back and forth, so they can inadvertently dodge things, which is pretty fun. And the old pink horrors moving on up. The Death Globe Bombardier is going to be heading, to heading towards the middle objective. Skaven really got this one. Oh, is it going to be the dreaded 13th spell? Give it to me, Precious. It's so cool. Oh, look at that. And the Storm Vermin storming from the pits. They've got their halberds out. They've got their armor piercing. And man, I have to say, it's refreshing to see a Skaven player playing without power grab and just playing normally. And it can totally work too, man. It can totally work. The Storm Vermin halberds getting the old shanks as the Rout Ogres continue hustling those bad boys down. Objective number two here. Being held by the rats, objective three by the rats, and no real Zinch momentum here on this side. Um, they are not going to be able to get it. Got a couple of units coming in, but the rats are easily just going to control them. Storm Vermin Halberd's going to be heading out. I feel like they don't last very long. It looks like they're like almost already done. Is that really for real? It's four seconds, three seconds, two, but that's their first life. Yeah, and then they're in critical unbinding, which I believe is another, yeah, they have another 30 seconds. That makes more sense. The Storm Vermin chasing things off. Globadier's temporarily shut down by the Sorcerer Lord. Zinch does have a little bit of back pressure going on. Catapults are kind of getting perpetually turned off and on, but overall should be able to stabilize. Looking at the points here, we do see a massive points lead here for our Skaven Champion, and the Love Guru is going to tap out. Shout out to the Love Guru, man. That was a fun game. I don't think I've seen you playing in tournaments before, but you did very good. You're playing against a top-tier player. Pink has won many tournaments on Total Tavern before uh, in the earlier seasons. So shout out to you, Love Guru. You played a great game against a very good player. Keep your head up, and I hope to see you sign up for some tournaments because your build was very good. The Zinch build was very good. Just some of the execution was uh, a little bit tricky at times. So GG, well played. All righty. And uh, overall for the Rados, play Claw Catapults and Mass were always really, really fun to see. And uh, yeah, Globet Ears with 2100 value is awesome, man. It is awesome indeed. All right, so currently Pink is going to be the king of the hill by a substantial margin. So let us see who is going to be getting into the lobby next. We got Rat in a Cage. Despite all my rage, I am just a rat in a cage. So we are going to do Astucci Castle for our next one. It's a beautiful, beautiful map. And let's go roll the factions for our mighty champions. So here we go. Go, go, precious. Go, go, mighty precious. Pink deserved to win just for resisting the temptation of the power grab. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, so Pink is going to get High Elves, and it is going to be playing against uh, Rat in a Cage. It's going to be playing... No, I, I like to see... I actually like, prefer to see players not meme in this format. Like, light memes are okay, experiments, but full-on memes where they just are guaranteed to lose, and Ogres are banned because they're stupid, so... We're not playing ogres. No ogres until CA fixes them. It's a protest. Um, all right. So where are we? Oh, my God. Give us demons of chaos. Dude, the gods just want the ogres, but it's not going to happen, dude. I'm not going to let it happen. <laughs> Two ogre rolls in a row. Oh, my God, dude. If it lands in ogres again, I swear, dude. No. God, we've had so much Norska today, but did we have Norska in the previous game? No, we didn't. So it's fine. So we can, they can re-roll if they want something different. So pink, GG well played. All right, so you are going to get High Elves and uh, Rat in a Cage, you're Norska. So I need you to message me if you want to re-roll. A troll auto pick. Ogres versus Ogres, dude, no. I, I I despise the ogres, just like the, just how OP and buggy they are. It's just like it's it's just horrible. All right, so what's it gonna be? High elves and rat in a cage. You are Norska. I need to know if you want rerolls, either of you guys. So you have your moment. You want the rerolls? Hey, sounds good. You want a reroll? They are. So checking to see if the players want rerolls. Okay, so Pink is going to keep the High Elves, but we are getting a Norskin reroll. So let me go ahead and do that real quick. So no Norska, because uh, we can't reroll into the same thing, and none of the factions from the previous game. So no Skaven or no Zinch. Everything else is welcome. We haven't had any Dowie today. Oh, oh no. <laughs> the Demons of Chaos. Oh no, I'm so sorry, Rat in a Cage. Although it is winnable, um, Doc. I I did win this matchup several times in tournaments last season. 
So this is winnable, but you really need to know what you're doing with Demons of Chaos. Chorps are a low, low tier faction at the moment, yeah. They just need some cost reductions on a lot of units. In all the history of your Total War Warhammer multiplayer, who has been the most oppressive faction? Vampire accounts probably have the longest reign of being OP. Because Vampire accounts were OP through Warhammer 1 and all of Warhammer 2. And for a lot of Warhammer 3. But only recently have they been balanced out. You, you can do it! Yeah, so you have good, some good choices here. I'm, give, I'm giving the demons player like some tips because like otherwise it's just going to be if they don't know how to play demons it's going to be brutal. All right, good luck, have fun. That's that's all the tips you're that's all the tips you're getting. My my old man hands can't type any further. So, how would you fix demons? Um, I think you don't like you you just buff demon units on other rosters and then demons of chaos will benefit so um just give me your build i don't remember the build off i think my build was double nurgle soul grinder um double blood reaper on foot with bellicor and plague bearers and then i have screamers and flesh hounds in reserve and nurglings in reserve also i think that was my build something like that yeah All right, I gave some tips, but I mean, it's not easy because Pink is a super high level player. Pink is very good. So um, this is not going to be like a freebie. <laughs> Bellicor is good. Bellicor is good. Yeah, Bellicor is very strong against elves. You, you just, you basically just bring either Melkoths, spam Melkoths, Mystifying Masma, uh, or use Pit of Shades. They're both viable choices. So when do you think the Dowie will get a DLC? They're actually the next ones getting a DLC. So Empire Dwarves and Nurgle are getting DLCs next. So. Uh, that's that's coming up in Thrones of Decay, which have they said when Thrones of Decay is coming out? Um, I think Thrones is, I would guess it's got to be around the holidays, which would be a lot of fun, man. Which would be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We will see, ladies and gentlemen. We will see. All right. So let's see what our uh, Demons of Chaos player will do. I don't know about the skill level of the um, rat in a cage here, but um, should be fun. Should be fun. Pink has uh, been pretty tyrannical so far. Yeah, who's after that? Is it is it is the corn DLC after the Thrones of Decay or is it Slanesh? I'm not sure which one it's gonna be. I'm not sure. God, I would have such a hard on if we could get dedicated servers for this game. I would actually, if we got if if the if the balancing document we're working on actually gets implemented and we got like and we actually got some like solid dedicated servers, man, I would I would host some big money tournaments. I would hustle for sponsors, like thousands of dollars. Like, but man, it's just the fact that we don't have that infrastructure in place just makes big money tournaments like so haggard, you know. Granted, the last one went very well. Um, we didn't have any lag or any disconnect issues or anything like that, so that was nice. But um, corn's last, yeah. Good old corn. Yeah, the corn DLC haven't even been announced. Yeah, corn will probably get a. I can see like a Northern Barbarians DLC where it's like corn and Norska. That would be really cool. We get like corn, Norska, and um, I don't know who else hasn't been updated in a long time. So here's here would be like a conspiracy theory, right? So we get Northern Barbarians, which would be a corn and Norska DLC. That'd be rad. Like those two having infighting and like fighting for dominance of the North, and Norska gets some updates, and Corn gets updates, and then after that, getting uh, like a Nagash update would be cool. So Vampire Counts get updated, uh, get some new stuff, we get a Nagash faction, and then we also get Vampire Coast getting an update would be rad. And maybe Tomb Kings get hit there as well, so it's like a big undead update. That would be rad to give them all new units. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I can remove Ogres from the from the faction selection. I will do that. Is the player allowed to try and get in the map? No, no, only once per player. Yeah, because we want to make sure more people can play. Yeah, you want to make sure more people can play. 
Oh, hey, Drew, the other game is definitely going to last long, dude. It's, I mean, Total War, despite CA's massive blunders that they've made in terms of, like, you know, decision-making, it's a very pop... Warhammer is a very popular, you know, intellectual property, and it has a pretty passionate player base that I think will stay even through the pits of hell, so I think we're totally fine. Wait for 40k Total War for dedicated servers? Oh, my God, I'd be so excited, dude. That'd be so exciting. Yeah, man, it's going to be good. I would like Nurgle to get Putrid Blight Kings. I know they're like an end times unit, um, but Putrid Blight Kings would be super cool. If you guys don't know what those are, let me show you. Like, I wouldn't mind them taking some end times units, even though I know they said they weren't going to do like end times. Like, it's like kind of a different timeline of sorts. Um, I think Putrid Blight Kings would be super cool. Like, Nurgle Aspiring Champions with like great weapons would just be the most badass shit ever. If you guys haven't seen them, here's what they look like. These are in tabletop, so... Uh, yeah, they're really, really cool. They're like these just heavy metal, like super tanky elite Nurgle units. And I would love to see these guys. They, they would be really, really cool. Yeah, I would, I would uh, sign me up for that for sure. Okay. If Total War could survive the Rome 2 launch, Empire will last. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Alrighty. Games Workshop has accepted us to... Can this in bad behavior with their sweet, sweet plastic? It's so true, isn't it? It's so true, dude. Yeah. Yeah, Glocken could be fun. There's a lot of echo on the mic. Yeah, there's a little bit. I've tried to soundproof this room. So the room that I have to record in is like very open. And I literally have like soundboard, soundproofing pads around and like a, this big rug, but it still doesn't help. So I'm sorry if there's a little bit of echo. It's just a it's pain. Maybe I can fix it a little. I'm away from the microphone now, so. Man, there you go, man. There you go. Yeah, those those units would be cool though. Getting the uh, getting the old severed claw. Holy shit! He brought Red Olgor. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! It's Red Olgor. So the build that I told him to bring would have probably actually dominated this high elf build. I told him to go double soul grinder of Nurgle because it crushes elite high elves. It'll crush their spears, their bows, with all the ranged attacks. But he's He's seeing red, dude. He's coming for blood. Um, oh, God. Oh, God, dude. It's happening. We got red Olgor, uh, Plague Bears, and Nurglings for cap weight. Not a bad idea. But the Elven build's going to be pretty good against this. Red Olgor, I believe, is an anti... Is he an anti-large duelist? We'll find out. We'll find out for sure. Rad Olgor? You mean sad Olgor? <laughs> yeah, red Olgor isn't terrible. He does have passive healing in combat. Like, he can do work for sure. Um, the, so the build I suggested was double soul grinder with double uh, blood reaper and then Bellicor. So a very SE focused build. And then you just uh, bombard the archers and grind down their infantry uh, with your blood letters and plague bears and then call in or plague bears. And then you call in blood letters once the archers are dead and you can win. That's kind of how that matchup goes usually. But um, I mean, anything could happen, guys. Anything could happen. It's a pretty meme build, but it's not awful. Those Sisters of Avalorn, if you can find a way to shut them down, you can definitely win the fight. But Imric is a raid boss, too. Imric will beat the brakes off Red Olgor. Although Red Olgor is, is a pretty respectable fighter. 8-5 against Imric's 9-5, so the HP difference isn't that big. He does have anti-large and good combat stats, but the fire damage is going to suck. Because I believe Imric has... Oh, Imric, yeah, does have the fire resist. That's going to suck for Red Olgor pretty bad. Um, so yeah, Red Olgor is healing in combat. What is it? Gore Feast. Yeah, it's 0.10, so it's not like insane. And uh, yeah, he's got the Demonic Onslaught and the Deathbringer. Very heavy metal. Looks like he's going to be playing the side objective out of the gates here. Plague Bears are probably one of your best frontline choices as the Demons of Chaos. Their high HP pool means they can survive arrows, even though they still will take a lot of damage. At least they won't just insta-kill them like Blood Letters or, uh, or the Slanesh Infantry, right? But um, yeah, we'll see. Nurglings here in the back. Blood Reaper and a Plague Ridden on the ground. So the Plague Ridden bad boy... He's uh, pretty good here uh, with Red Olgor. You know, the Fleshy Abundance on Red Olgor is, is strong. And Stream of Corruption is a good spell, too. So, yeah, big <laughs> big Red. He's got a big iron on his hip, dude. He's ready to go. So, um, yeah. The Elven build, pretty cool. Keepers of the Flame are an awesome choice because Keepers of the Flame, of course, do uh, have magic damage. So they can move up on the point and uh, hold that with their magic damage. We've got Spears and Silver and Guards, Sisters of Avalorn. If the Demons can find a way to shut these down... Here's the interesting thing about this matchup that I've learned from playing it in the past. You can use Flesh Hounds and Screamers together to dominate pretty much any Elven mobility, right? If they come in with Silver Helms, like the Screamers dive them and then the Flesh Hounds nibble on them and you just trade super well. So you can do flank overloads on Elves very effectively with Demons of Chaos, actually. 
Um, you really can. Yeah, yeah, it's like a Shogun 2 castle. Isn't that cool? This is Castle Astucci. It's one of our maps. They're like in Nippon, basically, which is pretty rad. Our map makers do such a good job, man. They do a really, really cool job. All right, so Imric is on the way, and uh, here they come. The Duel of Fates is upon us. Red Olgor, the champion of the people. It, no, it's, it's supposed to be Cathay, you think? It doesn't. It looks more like a Nippon castle. I mean, this is more like... Yeah, it looks a little bit more Japanese in terms of its influence. Oh, wait, no, wait. Those are... Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I see the Cathay flags. Okay, so it's supposed, to, it's supposed to be Cathay, I suppose. But hey, it could be Nippon for all we know, right? It could be Warhammer Japan. Mage of Life on the way. Dwellers Below. Not a bad choice against, uh, you know, Festering Stooges or any elite infantry. And Earthblood is obviously very good for Emmerich. And the demons need to move out of the trees. This is a big misplay here. You, the plague bearers are turbo slow, right? So if you, um, if you don't start moving to the objectives, you're not going to get them initially, and you really need to get them against the elves, or else you're going to pay the troll toll. Pink is going to punish this super hard. I wouldn't hate seeing Red Olgor duel Emric. I think it'd be fun, but Emric is just straight up stronger. Although the big demon does have some cool buffs. He does have the Hellblade here. So once he gets twenty or more kills, he gets a twenty percent buff. Lots of cool stuff like that, and. Uh, yeah, that's a Japanese castle. Yeah, that's right. That's what I was saying. It looks just like the ones in Shogun. You definitely got to move out these Plague Bearers. All right, so the Plague Bearers are going to hustle now. Emmerich is going to discover the dreaded demon infestation in the bushes, and he's going to be trying to shut that down. Screamers being called in, which is a great choice. Screamers can uh, definitely take on Emmerich with the help of Red Olgor. They're going to be forcing that bad boy back, and uh, the demons are going to have to find a way to push the middle. They're going to need to come this way because um, they can't just win on one objective, obviously. So what you do if you're the demon army, you just park one plague bearer right here and then you move the rest of your army towards the middle and you save resources. If you're the demons, wait until you have like, I don't know, 2000. And then you summon out like a bunch of furies and hounds at the same time and you swarm their backfield. That's how you have to do it. That's how you have to do it. So Red Olgor cackling in the skies and uh, the screamers of Zinch are nearby also. They're going to be maneuvering and uh, looking for some prey if they can. See what I'm saying about the Plague Bears? you got to move them out a little bit earlier if you can. And it looks like the Plague Bears are going to be heading towards the middle. Now, are we going to be seeing a Soul Grinder? Soul Grinders would just be such breadwinners here. They would just nail the, just shoot these Sisters of Avalorn and the Keepers of the Flame. Would all be incredibly weak against them. Lothern Sea Guard coming out to the side objective, which is good. Lothern Sea Guard will move up and be able to shoot the Plague Bears pretty comfortably. But the response is Flesh Hounds. You just call it Flesh Hounds or regular Hounds or Furies even. Uh, flesh Hounds probably wouldn't be the right response, actually, since Lothern Sea Guard do have Spears. So you would want to call in basic Warhounds, although they don't have them. Yeah, you have Furies, so it'd be Furies would be your like an your infantry-sized uh, kind of diving piece. So uh, here they come. The Blood Reaper's on the way up. Red Olgor looking for uh, that booty. He's going to be on the hunt. And now we're going to start seeing Plague Bears taking some heavy, heavy damage here. The magic damage of the Sisters of Avalorn, very good. There's a little bit of terrain cover here, not a ton. There is some, and now Flesh Hounds need to find a way around the backfield if they can. So the Flesh Hounds need to be looping right now, hardcore. And he still hasn't even captured his home objective yet, or the one that he really allocated his resources on. So could be paying the price. And so now we do see the Alpha Strike coming in, which is good. Um, High Elves have been incrementally calling out infantry, so they might not have too much. They do have two Reavers, but Reavers will actually lose the Flesh Hounds in a straight-up fight, depending on the circumstances here. And now the Screamers are going to be moving up. So... It seems like the micro might be overwhelming the Demons of Chaos player a little bit. There's obviously a lot of stuff, you know, moving pieces here and there, and they might be struggling a little bit against all these. But now the Sisters of Avalorn do get dove on by Furies, and also some Flesh Hounds are going to be pushing through into the backfield. And they do start to take some big damage, which is good. Plague Bearers arriving in the front line, but Plague Bearers will be massacred by the Keepers of the Flame. Emmerich moving into the backfield. Red Olgor needs to be right here right now. He basically needs to be diving on top of these archers while the other ones are being compromised and they're busy. And he needs to get those dives going, but it looks like that's not going to be the case. Fury's being called out, but you got to watch out for the Reavers. Reavers are quite nasty, and uh, Red Olgor not being active is a big, big mistake here for Rat in a Cage. So he needs to get over there, get his characters in. Flesh Hound's still swarming, and uh, they are able to get on top of the other Sisters of Avalorn here. So overall, the back pressure is not terrible as the Plague Bears do arrive in the front line. And now your boy Red Olgor is going to be cruising in for a bruising. So he needs to get busy. He's a big, expensive centerpiece. You can't afford to have Red Olgor just kind of standing around doing nothing. Demon's holding on to the side point. Red Olgor uh, now moving in. These Houndos have gotten some pressure into the backfield. But overall, Red Olgor now going to be taking a big duel up in the sky. Oh, the duel of champions. But yeah, Red Olgor is going to lose this because of the sisters. Sisters are going to put a ton of hurt. But he does pop Deathbringer. 773 weapon strengths. Pretty badass. Emmerich will take some work. Flesh Hound's being forced path onto the Sisters of Avalorn. Plague Bears and company a little bit tied up right there. And now we do see Red Olgor getting punished. And the High Elves are going to be dropping some sweet, sweet steaming hot payloads right here. 
So Dwellers Below, beautiful cast right there. Stream of Corruption was very, very good. That was a nice one. It does nail down the Sisters of Avalorn Screamers are uh, doing okay against Reavers. We got Nurglings and more Flesh Hounds coming in. But Red Olgor is getting absolutely slapped. And not surprised. Emmerich has access to healing. And also the Sisters of Avalorn are just doing magic damage against Red Olgor. So he's having a bad time. Demonic Onslaught popped. Gives him a charge bonus and some cool stats for sure. You can get Red Olgor to about 1,000 weapons rank. It's pretty bonkers. But at the end of the day, this looks like a massacre. Uh, it just seems like the micro was uh, almost not. It was, there were some good good ideas, but the execution wasn't quite there. And uh, we are going to be seeing the Hiles basically just pick them apart. The Demons of Chaos build was very ambitious. Not to say, though, that the build was so bad it couldn't win. I, I do think that the Demons of Chaos build with a little bit of a different decision making, uh, maybe like playing the high ground objective, trying to pull apart the more static Hile for army, could have actually won this game. But, um, you know. At the end of the day, it just, it, it just didn't get it done. So Emmerich is just going to be nibbling down these demons here. We do see Red Olgor cackling in the deep, currently rocking about 800 value, which isn't bad. Flesh Hounds engaging versus Reavers. Nurglings coming into support. Flesh Hounds will do pretty well there. They nibble through light armor quite efficiently. And the dreaded Red Olgor is going to be making his last stand as he charges into the backfield. Sisters of Avalorn lighting him up, dude. He's just getting roasted by these bad boys. He does get a cool attack animation there. But um, Emmerich is going to come. The Lord of Dragons. Not going to be abiding any demons in his backfield. And this game is basically over. The value difference is doubled. And uh, it's just going to be a long, slow suffering. So uh, Rat in a Cage probably could tap out here. And I think it would be completely warranted. As Red Olgor gets Grotty chopped into the Shadow Realm. Screamers of Zeech trying their best here. And Emmerich just going straight Doom Slayer here, yes, as he hunts down the various demons. Plague Bear is still holding firm here on the side, despite being shot by missiles. And uh, yeah, they're, they're not terrible, man. I ain't terrible, but the rest of the Demon's Army is going to get folded up like a piece of paper. Keepers of the Flame are awesome here. They got 1,200 value. Their magic damage super good. The Blood Reaper, uh, not a bad choice. I do like the Blood Reapers a lot. They're, uh, they're, they're decent little cost-effective fighters. They're really cheap, too. You can get them, like, bare bones, and they do their job. But, yeah, man. That's going to be game blouses. Here on the far side, we do see old Imric battling with uh, the Screamers, but the Sisters of Avalorn are actually good fighters. They have almost 40 melee attack. Well, they have 40 melee attack on the point. 52 melee defense, so they should be able to win it. And, uh, yeah, you need Soul Grinders of, of Nurgle in this matchup. You really do. They are so effective at breaking the high elf formations and forcing the high elves to move forward. And then you can, like, have more advantageous engagements. So, um, so yeah, that's that. So Amrick now bouncing over, going after the Blood Reaper. He is a demonic crumbling, which is going to be bad. Nurgling's being called out. And, uh, yeah, GG well played. Nothing else is going to go on here. This is, this is basically it. There's, there's just a couple of haggard plague bears coming out, which will be massacred by archers. Imric basically going to be going uh, balls deep, killing whatever he wants. Hey, I appreciate the Red Olgor play, though. Shout out to you. Bringing your boy Red Olgor against a top-tier to uh, top tournament player is an ambitious one. But nonetheless, we love seeing Red Olgor, and he will be redeemed someday. Don't worry. Red Olgor will have his time in the sun. He is a mighty champion and uh, certainly has some, some legends about him. So, <laughs> please put it into this. <laughs> All right. Let's go here. All right. Now, what do we got? Well played, Rat in a Cage. You, you were a mighty champ. Lost Temple of Sotex is going to be the next map. Although we could do an Oaken Shield. Let's do Oaken Shield. Let's do a little open, open field action. Napoleon. All right, so we got Napoleon here versus Pink. So let's roll this. Let's get our army selection tool. Filter uh, races. All right, so let me do this. I'm just going to take the Ogre Kingdoms out here. Great. All right, so now we're going to go roll the factions. Can I play with the Shadows of Overpriced? Oh, dude, of course you can, yeah. But it's first come, first serve, so it's whoever gets into the lobbies. Okay, so this is going to be rolling for pink. Red Ogre will get redemption in this life or the next. He will. Here they come. This is going to be the... Oh, I was excited to see... Oh, we got corn. For player one, so that's going to be for pink. I think Napoleon's going to get it. Napoleon has joined our lobby, apparently. Uh, the, you'll see a spot open up as soon as somebody leaves the lobby, and then you just join. Corn versus Norska. The, we had Norska rolled last game, too, so I'm just going to re-roll that. We've had Norska like 10 times today. Although it is a kind of a fun Northern Barbarian duel. I think we can uh, switch it up here. Okay. So we got uh, Inkari. Okay, so we got Slanesh versus Corn. I actually think this could be a really fun matchup. All right, let's get it. Okay, so you are Corn, and uh, your opponent is... I don't know who you are in Discord, Napoleon, but you are going to be the forces of Slanesh. 
That is going to be that. Hey, HP Lovecraft, <laughs> the mighty Eldritch Master here. Hey, man, loving the stream and the Skaven play. If we get another faction, who do you think it will be? Uh, I think it would be like a sub faction of one of the factions we already have. So like uh, some sort of uh, some sort of funny business with that. Yeah. Hey, let's go, man. This is going to be fun. Corn versus Slanesh, kind of two lower tier factions going at it. I love it. Let's see how good the micro is of our Slanesh player, though. That's really the question because that is a, a, a faction that, you know, requires a lot of finesse. The only mods we're using are the Total Tavern Tournament Map Pack. That's the only one. That is it. Now, rarely if ever seen Corn versus Slanesh. It's a fun one. It's a great matchup. I think it's great. A lot of mobility, a lot of hit and run. Both factions are pretty fast. End would be cool. I would definitely like to see that. I mean, dude, there's so much. Warhammer has so much potential. It's just a question of how far CA is going to take it, you know? Not in Discord. I'm Napoleon. Uh, don't understand all this new stuff. Hey, no, no worries, dude. No worries, Ludovic. I hope to just see you do well. Um, against Corn, You can bring elite infantry against Corn, which is kind of fun. Because Corn doesn't have any magic to just insta nuke them. But yeah, you definitely, a lot of Marauder Horsemen dueling and... Yeah, I don't know. Seekers of Slanesh are pretty good here too. They can they can do some good work. There's plenty of choices. You can go with Inkari even if you want to. I mean, there's lots of fun fun units. It just depends on how good your micro is. Yeah, it all depends. Uh, Jordan, a lot of people do use camera mods. A lot of people use what's called debug camera where they play from outer space. Like if you ever used to watch Anticity play on his streams, he, he would often joke that he would play this game even if it was just like pixels or sticks on the screen. You know, that's why he plays. <laughs> Which has always made me laugh, but um, yeah, you can play with debug camera that lets you go into outer space, and it's it's a tactical advantage in multiplayer. But I don't like doing it because I like to see the units fighting. Otherwise, the game isn't really as interesting to me. So, Pwn would definitely go with Inkari. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. So the Oaken Shield is here. One sec, guys. I'm going to go refill my water real quick, and I will be right back. All right, we're back. So somebody in chat asking, have you ever considered working with the modder for stat rebalancing? No, I, it's been, a, I've, I've thought about it, but at the end of the day, I think it's better to, um, like if a faction's really problematic, you can restrict them. Uh, but yeah, doing a mod is, is, is I, you want people playing quick battle to be the, um, to be similar, right? Like the similar experience of the tournaments. By the way, uh, I think we're going to be seeing some progress with the domination map pool in the future. I've had some encouraging conversations with um, with some people over at the old uh, assembly. So I'm hoping that we can get rid of the bad maps in the map pool. And then we can just do quick battle streams again, which would be really fun. Because right now with the maps, like it's just miserable. But I think uh, I think we're going to do it. All right. There we go. Perfect. And the players are almost there. Stat mods will be, yeah, I think, yeah, stat mods, yeah, when CA stops supporting the game, yeah, exactly. Like when they when they fully abandon Warhammer Total War, that's when you bring out those kind of things. I, I think for now, they're still actively like taking feedback. Um, so I, I think, yeah. Uh, again, who knows if it'll get implemented? It might not, but they're taking it. Oh yeah, dude. Oh, look at these builds, holy shit. We got triple chosen of corn with dual weapons. Oh, badass. And the Hellforged Host with Scarbrand. And then we got the uh, the ROR Seekers here. Or the Heart Seekers. Yeah, man. Okay, this is a wild-ass build on both sides. I mean, with proper play, the Slanesh build would have the advantage for sure. Because it's going to be able to play multiple objectives better. But 
Jesus, dude, this build is just ridiculous. Look at this. Triple Chosen of Corn with Hellforged Host. Those infantry each cost like 1500 a piece, if not more. Jesus, dude. That's wild. I'm, I'm excited for this. The Slanesh build is definitely favored, though, because the horsemen are going to be able to kite and poke and do good damage, while Slanesh plays the other two side objectives. So I think they'll have a slight, slight edge in that regard. But again, Scarbrand's pretty quick, and he can maneuver back and forth on points and do some good stuff like that, so... Yeah, I'm working. I'm working on the rank thing. I've been. I had um, you know, I had a meeting with some of the people who work on battles, and I'm trying my best to get the rank system, like not the leaderboard per se, but to get the uh, to get the map pool better. So hopefully we'll be able to make some progress on that. Yeah, the corn build is really cool. It is. So we got chosen of corn, and uh, yeah, they're just gonna roll up and grab these two points. Slanesh has got the horseman. Sigvald's always a good choice for objective play. Of course, Scarbrand will kick his ass, but sometimes he can take it like a champ. Chaos Sorcerer of Shadows. This Pit of Shades is going to be Napoleon's best friend right now. So casting the Fat Pit of Shades on top of the Chosen, if cast effectively, could be very, very good. And uh, we do have the Internal Entourage. What the hell do these things even do? All right. So they have Soul Scent. So they do get increasing AP damage and melee attack based on units wavering near them. Devastating Flanker, Vanguard, and Perfect Vigor. And also the Obsessive Adoration. So it looks like they have a little bit of an aura. Whoa, wait a second. Is that a effect range? 35 meters. Is this a passive ability? And it gives plus effects uh, units. Oh, it only affects lords and heroes. I was going to say, if this was some sleeper ability that people just didn't notice, but it only buffs lords and heroes, which, um, you know, is still okay. But if this buffed units plus 14 melee attack, wherever it was fighting, that would be absolutely nuts. That would actually be really good. So Korn's going to waddle up and just try and play objectives three and two. And Slanesh is going to go poke with its horsemen. Pit of Shades, definitely going to be on the table. The Internal Entourage, these guys will be a big, big breadwinner, potentially. If they're able to isolate, let's say, one of these Cornate Warriors and, like, rear charge them while they're fighting, let's say, Mirror Guard and the front line, that is going to be good stuff indeed. So here they come, Chosen of Corn with dual weapons moving up on the far side. We do get Marauder Horsemen popping out. Uh, but the Corn Horsemen typically get out skirmished by the Slanesh ones. They have better range, and Javelins usually out-trade Throwing Axes. Uh, throwing axes are better against armor, like static armor and things like that. But in terms of like the skirmish game, Slanesh with good mi micro should have all the advantage. Seekers being called out, which is good. And that's what you do if you're Slanesh here. It seems like Napoleon kind of knows what's going on. You play the objectives on the outsides. And wherever a Korn's main army is, you just ignore them and play the other objectives. And then just while they're in transition, moving between the points, you try and isolate units with your fast cavalry and pick them off. Uh, this is something I've seen like a million times. It's always very fun. A little bit of skirmishing action going down. Horsemen getting a little bit danger close to one another. You're definitely going to want to pull these back. So the Marauder Horsemen of Slanesh are going to be retreating. And we do get Seekers coming across. So the Seekers are going to be rear charging into the back. And will they get the catch? A couple Horsemen of Corn do go down. But you do not want these Seekers to do battle with Scarbrand. Because if he rampages them into some of the Chosen... Uh-oh. Uh-oh, is he going to rampage? Is he going to pop the rampage? That would be a clutch play right now by Pink. If you can get a little bit more HP damage on those Seekers. Oh, but now you got to do a little... He didn't have quite enough. Oh, that would have been a dead unit, basically. They would have been dragged into the Chosen. It looks like the Rampage wasn't quite there. He needed to hit them, like, one more time. Now, as far as the skirmish game goes, Korn's cavalry are being picked apart, but the Chosen of Korn certainly should be doing some pretty devastating work here on the objective if they can get any infantry fights. But Slanesh is not going to give them any fair fights. And here we do get the Hellforged Toast of the Chosen of Korn being surrounded. We got Mirror Guard in the front, Eternal Entourage in the back, and this is just how Slanesh likes to do it. Just straight up from behind here. They get around the back, and those Cornate Warriors are uh, taking a massive beating from that devastating flanker ability. But now there's reinforcements coming in, and you can see the resilience of the Corn Warriors. Despite being surrounded and in a terrible situation, they're still able to hold firm and continue trading. Now on this side, Chosen of Corn engaged against devoted Marauders. Scarbrand afflicted by the enfeebling foe, and Seekers get a great engagement here. Napoleon with some very nice micro here, as the Seekers of Slanesh do collapse onto the Fleshhounds of Corn, But there are Spears nearby as well, so... Um, We'll have to see how that whole engagement goes. Big Pit of Shades going down. Nice one there. Did it really hit the epicenter? It did, yeah. So those Hellforged Hosts are going to be getting pounded. And now the Eternal Entourage getting in once again and hitting those old Hellforged Host units right in the back. But those Corn Infantry do not give a shit. They're hanging in there like absolute champions. Fleshhounds being called out to attack the Eternal Entourage. The Entourage will win against the Fleshhounds, depending on the charge situation. But wise play here from Napoleon is to pull back. 
and get behind your spears and then counter charge back in. That's always a very, very strong play. As far as this side goes, it looks like Korn has not been able to get the objective yet. Marauder Horseman just javelining down, but the Chosen of Korn are uh, hanging in there, man. They're butchering these Devoted Marauders. Absolute butchering. I mean, they hit really hard. They definitely could use a cost reduction. Chosen of Korn are very overpriced, but yeah, I mean, in the right situation, they still can do good despite being an overpriced unit. Seekers of Slanesh coming into fight, but they're going to meet the same fate. They're going to get wrecked. Um, Scarbrand and these Chosen of Corn with the 56 melee attack are just going to give the dirty to these things. But the Javelins will probably start adding up over the course of the long game. Seekers doing some okay armor piercing, but Chosen of Corn are winning that fight very, very strongly. Back on the middle objective, it looks like Corn has got their clutches on this one. The full health Chosen and the other Chosen unit here actually doing some damage against Sigvald, which is interesting. You don't see that happen terribly often. Farside is owned by Slanesh, and the Eternal Entourage able to juke around and uh, lure the Flesh Hounds in. So good micro there, luring the Flesh Hounds into the, basically, uh, the Marauders and the Spear units. And now the Entourage is going to be coming in, providing magic damage against Hellforged Hosts. But the Hosts might be able to win this. Man, the Corn Infantry are really hanging in there. Like, it seems like they're getting isolated and having rough engagements, but then you look and they're just still going there and uh, doing work. Sigvald being circle beaten a little bit, and uh, now we got Seekers of Slanesh coming in to pile in on those Chosen. This would be the most erect Pit of Shades, like a huge Pit of Shades right here on those Chosen of Corn would be absolutely devastating, absolutely devastating. So we'll see what happens. Horseman running away from Scarbrand. Marlin Scarbrando is back, and he is coming to get engaged in the middle. And this could be Gotham's Reckoning. If Scarbrand comes in and is able to just start beating down this caster, that Chaos Sorcerer and Sigvald, that could basically end the game right there. Meanwhile, on the other side, Devoted Marauders and Devoted Marauders trying to fight, but the Flesh Hounds might actually be able to win this. Slanash is going to need to get some cab over here, pull their Eternal Entourage, and have them come and uh, help take down these Flesh Hounds, because they're actually losing this fight. Hellforged Toast up to about 800 value, cleaving through the Devoted Marauders. Horsemen here still throwing their javelins. Sigvald getting whooped on, though, by Scarbrand. Scarbrand currently sitting at about 900 value. Nice pit of shades there. Looks like it is going to be hitting quite a bit of the Cornate units, including the Chosen of Corn. So that's really what you need. The value is close in this game. Certainly close, but Sigvald is getting dunked on so hard by Chadbrand. Chadbrand is just a, a menace, dude. He is putting a, a beat down here. So it's going to be Marauders of Corn being called out to support some of the elite infantry. Javelins doing work, but Scarbrand is still pretty heavily armored at 90 armor, so he can take it like a champ. And Sigvald gets Rampage, but Sigvald popping Mortal Blow as well as Slippery and Sliver Slash. So Sigvald with 900 weapon strength right now. Dear God, that is so high. And he's going after Scarbrand, who's rocking 700. Now talk about a heavy metal chaos matchup, right? We got the champion of Slanesh fighting the champion of Korn. Very cool stuff. But of course, Slanesh not fighting fair, having some homies nearby. But overall, Scarbrand probably wins this despite the Sliver Slash, which was really cool. It did imbue him with magic damage too, which gives him a bonus for Scarbrand. Spears coming into support. Scarbrand could get a little bit surrounded here. We'll keep tabs on this fight. On the other side, we do see Korn take the objective. The Seekers of Slanesh are called in to help. Maybe they'll be able to finish off the Hellforged Host. But Sigvald's fighting really well in the fourth quarter of this game, ladies and gentlemen. He's hanging in there and putting up an excellent fight against his mighty champion. We also got the Princes of Perfection coming in, so the ROR Spears anti-large and they do have a debuff on them they have the uh so perfect musk so when they shank scarbrand they're gonna lower down his stats and look at that we also get the enfeebling foe sigvald didn't hear no bell man he's going he's getting in there looking at the other side objective let's take notes of this corn holding on to it their elite infantry actually doing really really well this game and grinding through the devoted marauders over on the middle scarbrand might be in some danger here all those debuffs and all that witchcraft that slanesh is bringing to the table is certainly helping a lot sigvald does have crazy melee defense sword of corn with the steel chair, nuking those devoted marauders. Absolutely disgusting. Scarbrand gets a huge blow on your boy Sigvald right here. Sigvald definitely in danger. Currently sitting at what appears to be 18 leadership. And uh, he might actually break. It's very rare you see Sigvald break because he's got like 100 base leadership. But in this case, he's going to go. Scarbrand claiming the skull of the Slanesh champion as Sigvald does fall. And the mighty demon of chaos is able to get the W. But it was, well, you know, Sigvald didn't go easily. That was a, a very, very pitched fight. So the Chosen of Corn probably going to be edging out this fight in the middle. We do see the value lead going for Ye Old Corn by about 1,100, give or take. Chosen of Slanesh being rampaged, but more devoted marauders being called out. But they're basically just going to be skulls for the skull throne. Those Chosen of Corn will butcher all of them. And now if Scarbrand can find a way to get on top of the Chaos Sorcerer and take that thing down, getting rid of the magic is going to be pretty big. So Pink goes for it, and we do see the Chaos Sorcerer getting taken down. He's at negative 16 leadership. Scarbrand getting big damage as the Cornate Horsemen come in for some buffering. To help countercharge the Seekers. And the middle objective, probably going to start flipping now. It depends. Those doggos are doing some good nibbling. And yes, it looks like it's going to flip. Scarbrand being unsummoned, which I don't know if you need to do that. I think having them on the battlefield, even with 1,000 HP, is probably still worth it. But, you know, it's fine. It's going to be preventing the army penalty. But it certainly gives Slanesh 
a little bit less to worry about on the battlefield. So there they go. Chosen of Corn, butchering the Devoted Marauders, even when they're at like 40, 30%, which is really cool to see. So those Devoted Marauders going to be running into the sunset. On the other side of the battlefield, we do see the Chosen of Corn and the Flesh Hounds nibbling away while the Marauders of Corn with throwing axes continue lurking. I think Slanesh is in big danger. I don't know if they're going to be able to pull this back. Corn does have a triple cap. Very comfortably controlling objective number one here, and objective number two is also uh, in, in good in good you know health here as well. So we will see. Chosen of Corn maneuvering, trying to hold back the Slaneshi onslaught. This has been a really good game. So shout out to you, Napoleon. I know you said you don't really play multiplayer too much, or maybe you just play quick battles, but you're playing a really good game here. And again, Pink is a very good player. So we've seen a lot of newer players coming into today's stream, which has been great. Uh, and performing very well against seasoned players too, despite losing. Like it, it was still a very good performance here from Slanesh. Good micro, good maneuvering, and uh, demonettes would have actually been really good here. Yeah, the exalted demonettes would have traded super, super cost effectively. Um, but yeah, you know, it's something you don't see terribly often. The, the the cavalry, the seekers can do good work, but it didn't seem like it was quite enough. Oh, chaos knights of corn, one of my favorite units. They're so badass. So they do get afflicted by the fascination, but they're just going to run these guys over. You guys ready? Here they go. So they got their uh, charges, they have their axes, and oh, we got blue balled. It's okay, it's a cool cinematic shot. Look at these, look at these guys. Just, these big badass hulking knights, dude. Oh, corn is so heavy metal. They're so heavy metal, dude. Love it. All right, so there they go. That's gonna be five here. And now we will see. Well played, Napoleon. You played a great game. So let's get this and go to Chateau de Rockfort. So if Pink, uh, this will probably be, if Pink manages to win, <laughs> I was going to say, here's the thing. If Pink wins this, I actually have to go in about 45 minutes to an hour. I actually have an hour and 10 minutes. Okay, I have a little bit of time. Look who shows up in the fourth quarter. It's the dreaded houseplant. Oh, man. Okay. Houseplant is here and he's pissed. He is pissed. All right, let's get it, man. Oh, the Dark Lord arrives. All right, so let's take on the uh, the King of the Hill here. Go to the news, roll for the factions. And this is going to be for pink. This is a heavyweight duel. The, the final boss, I know. I know it really is the final boss, isn't it? Okay, so Slanesh got rolled last game, so we can't pick them again, so. Okay, what's it going to be? What is it going to be? Okay, so we get corn. Oh, wow, we got the same two factions. What are the odds of that? Houseplant auto gets ogres. I know. He does. He does indeed. The final boss has truly arrived. All right, high elves for pink. And for houseplant, what are we going to get? The Dark Lord is here. He is. He is. A health bar appears. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, what is it going to be? Coast. Yes, I want this. I want to see Houseplant with Coast into High Elves. I want to see this. Hopefully Houseplant doesn't take a reroll. All right. So you got High Elves. And uh, Houseplant. Hell yeah, dude. I want to see a Coast game here. I want to see what they can do. He, he can choose to reroll if they want to, but we'll see. Verse coast and verse. All right. This this could be fun, dude. He's, he's taking the reroll. I hope he doesn't. Oh, it looks like he's playing it. It looks like he's playing it. I honestly think it's a good matchup for the high elves, but um, I'm curious to see what the house plant does. <laughs> The, the final boss emerges from the bushes, dude. Just the evil villainous laughter. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Did they have to use... No, they don't have to use the lords that are rolled. No, they don't. No, it's just the factions. Um, all right. I'll see what can be done. Hell yeah, dude. Houseplant with the... Oh, he's deciding to keep. He's not re-rolling, baby. Let's go. Yes. Yes. So he's keeping coast against the old uh, High Elves here. Probably going to see Celestia, I would guess. I think that's what the case is going to be. Um, <laughs> I 
<laughs> I just told Houseplant, I because I have to go after this game probably, but I told Houseplant, I'm like, you're basically just the final boss, dude. So embrace your role. <laughs> you're the final boss here on this stream. So we'll see. We'll see. Kind of struggles against Kosis. Oh, yeah, I'm curious to see how this is going to go. Can't remember. Did Pink have a... Uh, he, he, he had High Elves uh, two games ago. Or three games ago. It wasn't... It's just the previous game. So we mix it up. And, you know. We don't want to just have the same factions back and forth and back and forth. No Chowie today. No Chowie. This is one of my favorite things. Seeing the best players in the world play subpar factions is really interesting. Because you get to see what they like, what schemes they have, and what they can discover. You know, it's always, um, always a good time. Praying for a Van Guy's revenge. Crab stack. No, Houseplant's gonna try and win, which is what I want to see. I don't want to see memes. I want to see coast, like a good coast build here. I'm gonna take a peek at the builds real quick because I'm really curious, actually. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm, I mean, it looks good to me so far. Looks good to me on both sides. All right. Outstanding. Pink still hasn't really gotten into the build too much yet. Did Pink want to reroll? Let me check. Nope, no rerolls. Okay, Pink's just taking a while to get their build started. Maybe grabbing a drink real quick. Queen Bess on this map. Hmm, it's the problem with Queen Bess is High Elves can really dominate your scurvy dogs and stuff. So defending a Queen Bess is actually really hard. Especially if the High Elves have some sort of a flying wizard who could just fly over and like burning headed or like Illyrian Reavers diving it feels pretty bad. You know, you can you can pay the troll toll. Josh says, I love your streams more than any other stream right now. Hey, I'm glad to hear that, man. I've never even played any of these games. Yeah, you know, that thing about this game is it's like, even if you don't play it, it's pretty fun to watch. You know, it's like cool fantasy creatures and armies battling it out. And it's, uh, it's a good time. It's a good time indeed. Yeah, so defending your backfield can be tricky for Coast. I would, I would suspect Coast aggression, maybe. From Houseplant, yeah. We'll see, though. We'll see. Is Pink starting on the army? Okay, good. So Pink's working on the army right now. Excellent. But yeah, Lothar and, Se Lothar and Seaguard are excellent here. Honestly, I think you just spam Lothar and Seaguard and Spears. Like, spam Silverin, spam Lothar and Seaguard, call it a day. You know what I'm saying? If I were to, if I were playing, I would bring probably Mass Silverins, Mass Lotherins, and an Archmage with Burning Head, and that would be, like, it. You know? That would that'd be my entire build, like, out of the gate. And then from there, reserves would be Reavers, and it would be uh, Silver Helms, maybe. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That's probably what I would be jamming. Yeah. This game is what every fantasy battle wants, I know. How cool would it be if we got an RTS game? I don't think it'll ever happen, you know? It, sadly, it would be more likely to happen with Age of Sigmar, since that's kind of the new hotness. Um, but if we got like an Age of Empires, like StarCraft style game with, with you know, Warhammer Fantasy. That'd be so cool with like base building and like resource management. I think that'd be a great time, but you know, that that's really just like a power fantasy, right? You think Luther would be good against Zinch? Uh, I don't think so. He's a big target and like a good Zinch player will just run away from him with anything of value. Cause Zinch is already going to be going super wide against Vampire Coast. So Luther is better at killing big things. Like I was playing some practice games with Subutai last night. And uh, I was able to win with Vampire Coast against his Demons of Chaos by having Luther Harkin killing a great unclean one with like breath attacks and shooting and cycle charging. Um, but again, it wasn't like, you know, he's good at that. But if your opponent's going wide or has like fast mobile lords, he's not as good. Luther is like a duelist. He wants to go fisticuffs. All right. So we got Spears, Archers, and Teclas versus Solastra. So it's going to be Unsummon Solastra. So you, you call her in, you summon the Knights Errant, and then you unsummon her and call her back in later and just rinse and repeat it. It did get nerfed. It was a really OP strategy for a while, but it did get nerfed by CA. So it still is like strong, but not quite as egregious as it once was. But we got Morngulls, Bomber Mobs, four Morngulls. Wow, look at that. And then we do also have a Vampire Caster as well. Yeah, this is going to be a fun game. It's always fun to see Houseplant play. He's he's very good. He's um he's one of the folks who's helping me with the... Uh, with the balancing changes document as well. So we got we got a good crew of people. I basically invited the top players in the world um, from last season uh, to help me with that. So it's been it's been good so far. We're making some good progress. And uh, as soon as we get some solid notes, I'll show it to you guys. Give you some good feedback and everything like that. And we'll see what CA actually implements. Yeah, Solastra is cool, but she's going to be unsummoned Solastra. She probably has no spells. And it's just going to be summoning the Knights Errant, maybe fighting a little bit, and then being unsummoned. That's what I suspect. Oh, it's Peckless. Okay, we got Peckless coming in. So Peckless is here, 
And uh, yeah, fire damage, magic damage, great gooning. Fiery Convocation can be really nasty too. Peckless is fun. I, I like the Peckless pick a lot. On top of that, we do have Lothar and Seaguard into the sunset, and uh, they're going to be behind the spears. Very classic spear and bow formation. Bows have always been very good against Vampire Coast. Coast has a couple ways to beat this. One way is to use mortars, like a bunch of mortars, and have this like huge artillery formation. But um, Houseplant usually is more aggressive. I, I can't remember the last time I've really seen him. Yeah, Pony, I think your invite got lost in the mail. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I, think, I think it got lost. Yeah. Well, absolutely. If you want to take a look, we can go over it, man. Um, Winds of Death is going to be the Lord, the the spell. So he's going to be trying to get Winds of Death cast down on the uh, the Spear and Archer lines, which is pretty badass. Slostra on the other side with the Damn Knights Errant ready to go. And uh, yeah, Bombers and Deccan Mobs with Winds of Death cast. Slostra for the Knight Summons. And then the dreaded Quad Morgul push, which is really interesting. I don't know how that's going to work. Morgul's did get buffed last patch. EA did reduce their cost by 50, which is pretty neat. So um, yeah, it's going to be fun to see. Gonna be fun to see. Indeed, indeed. I've seen several non-power grab matches with the Skaven from tournaments if you're watching highlights. Yeah, yeah. They've been doing better, for sure. Uh, Skaven don't need to power grab to win. And honestly, the power grab thing is so predictable. Skaven players don't bring anything good. They just mass units. So they don't often have killing power. So, so yeah, it's gonna be good. Looking around here, sneaky, sneaky action on the far side. We'll, of course, keep tabs on that as it gets a little bit closer. Solastra going to be creeping up. Better watch out. I, I like the Peckless here. Peckless should just kill Solastra right now. Magic damage against the Ghost character. I would straight up just net Solastra and go for the kill. So Flock of Doom. There's no reason Peckless shouldn't be attacking Solastra right here. Absolutely no reason. That was a good Flock though, regardless. It does hit a couple units. And uh, now Peckless is going to be going after the Bomber mobs. Because the Coast doesn't have any shooting here or anything to really stop this. Unfortunately, I, I do think Peckless could be going after the Vampire Caster or something that's a little bit more valuable than just the Bomber mobs. But... At the end of the day, House Punch is going to ignore it. He does call it Lamprey's Revenge. The Lamprey's are good. They have high mass, armor piercing, and shooting. So they can keep Teclas honest. He's not going to be able to kind of fight those guys and really live his best life, right? Here comes the Zombie Pirate Jackhand Mobs. Objective's going to be opening up in a couple seconds here as Solastra Deer Fawn. Yeah, Peckless should be gooning these characters. It's like, look at the amount of damage we get on this Vampire Caster here. Solastra turns around and fights, and uh, Teclas could have stayed a little bit longer because Lamprey's are far away, but that is exactly what should have happened earlier. You should have netted down the caster and then just like, it honestly, probably bring it down to like half health there, right? So Fireborn being called out. Interesting. So we get the Fireborn. And the reason why you're seeing Fireborn is because of the crabs. He, you know, uh, Pink saw the crabs coming out, so wanted something anti-large to fight those bad boys. So Pekla is coming back in for round two. Definitely should cycle charge and go after this Vampire Fleet Captain. That's just straight up free real estate right now because there's no guns, there's no shooting, and boom, another nice shot. And now it's going to be pulling back again as Lampreys and Solastra are going to be trying to cause disruption. And that is uh, that is good. Nice work indeed. But when is the Morgul ambush going to be coming in? Will it be moving? Find out on today's episode. This objective is going to be taken by Coast. And now I believe we're going to see the units moving here on the other side as we see animated hulks being spammed out here by Houseplant. Winds of Death certainly in the wings. Going to be trying to get some archers. Peckless going to be coming in. Uh, what you need to do if you're Houseplant, which he obviously knows, is hide your Vampire Fleet Captain amongst your crabs. To make it so those bad boys aren't able to uh, aren't able to do it. So here it comes. We get the old deckhand mobs moving up. Archers blasting away into the zombie pirate deckhand mobs. A little bit of cap weight contest going on, but of course the high elves do have more units there. And coast going to be moving up. A bomber's being disrupted. These bomber mobs are going to be poked down. Peckless moving in to do battle with the zombie pirate gunnery mobs and keeping them from getting their sweet sweet bombards. But houseplant should have the micro to force the bombards. He should. And now Peckless coming in for another attack. That Vampire Caster has been having a bad time, but it looks like he does narrowly dodge that attack right there. And now the Damn Knights aren't going to be coming out. These things are devastating. He's going to slow those bad boys in Lance Formation. Oh, is that going to be a net? Oh, nice counterplay right there. So he nets down the Damn Knights Errant, knowing that that's going to be wasting a ton of their summon time. That was a really, really nice play there by uh, Pink. Very, very clean indeed. Look at the bomber mobs. They're throwing into Peckless. Actually doing a little bit of damage here. Crabs move it up. On the backside, we do get the Fireborn coming in. Fusro Da. As they get in and just start plowing through zombies. Dragon Princes will just obliterate these two zombie units. That's going to feel pretty good. But now the Morgul ambush is in full effect. Here it comes, baby. Morgul's have gotten on top of the Lothern Sea Guard. These archers are compromised. And suddenly Pink's like, oh god, dear god, what's in my backfield? Looks like the Damn Knights Errant did escape their net and have now penetrated in to cause a little bit of pressure. Peckless under duress. And uh, Vampire Coast is now moving up on all fronts. So the final boss of today's stream has arrived. Houseplant here causing uh, absolute destruction amongst the uh, battlefield. But we do get the Fireborn. No, just Reavers. Morgul's will trade okay into Reavers. Morgul's do here on combat. So one Archer unit 
gets taken down. The other Lothern Sea Guard going to get obliterated, and Fireborn really need to get over here right now. And that's going to be a little bit problematic for Houseplant, actually, because the Fireborn are going to just destroy these Morgols, like, super hard in combat. He needs to find a way to support there. But as far as the objectives go, we do see the Hyle Formation collapsing, and a large reason for that is because the Archers are super distracted, so it's allowing Coast to advance up in the front line. Morgols breaking through the Reavers here, and really, really just doing a lot of damage. Really, really cool ambush, man. That was super fun. Crabs coming in from all sides and animated hulks. The big coastline, here they come. Hey, that's pretty good. Coastline, right? It's perfect. The coastline is here. So the crabs and the animated hulks and the bloated monstrosities moving up and engaging in a big blob fight here, which is certainly not going to be bad. Sloster actually staying in the fight. Big blasting charge is going down as the zombie mobs uh, do eviscerate those archers. And I would imagine the Morngul still moving around in a bit of a goon squad. Fireborn uh, isolating and killing the uh, big haunters right there. Not the haunters, but the ROR's. And now this is the play. Retreat the Morngul's back to your main army now that you've done your job against the archers and protect them against the Fireborn and use them in a blob fight. Because if they get isolated in an open field by Fireborn, they're going to get absolutely karate chopped. So the coastline has arrived and a lot of the archers unfortunately have gotten caught in melee here. As Houseplant's going to be calling out more animated hulks and Depth Guard with pull arms, which is a nice inclusion. That's going to really allow him to clamp down on this objective here and do some good work. Animated hulks moving across. We do see the Fireborn engaging against a lot of big targets. So that's a good engagement here for Pink. Pink is going to be getting a nice little pick here as the Morngulls and various units do start to take a beating. No healing for Vampire Coast. The Vampire Fleet Captain did not bring Invo. It's basically just Winds of Death. But Fireborn has got to be getting big value right now. Yeah, up to 1300, crumbling these Morngulls here, doing big damage against the animated hulks. And now we do see Teclas going for the kill on Solastra, which could be a strong play. Reaver is coming for the objective ninja on the side. Solastra could get her eyes pecked out here by Peklas. We'll have to see. Looks like she's at 12 leadership right now, but the Depth Guard polearms are coming in to salvage her, so that could work. And overall, this is a really, really close game. Value's dead even, ladies and gentlemen. The ninja on the side, I think, is going to be a really strong play. We do get Bomber Bats coming out, so Jet Chopper Bomber Bats will be able to kill these Reavers off the point, but you're going to need to get some capture weight there. And Peklas looks like he is going to be able to get away. And Houseplant will manage to hold on to the two objectives. Farside being held by a couple archers and spears. So nothing too crazy going down there. Fireborn probably at 2, 2k value right now, I would imagine. Let's check. Yeah, 2,000 value on the Fireborn. <clears throat> very, very good stuff. Melting pretty much exclusively large targets. So talk about a very cost-effective fight here for the plant. Granted, a lot of zombies pushing up. We still have the deckhand mobs and the bomber mobs, which are penetrating deep into the backfield here. This objective ninja is actually a really, really strong play. Kosa is going to have to send something over there to kind of salvage that point. However, the bomber mobs will kill these reavers, but the question is, will it be quick enough? So we see the bombardments coming down. Reavers start taking pretty massive HP, but I think they can stay the course and probably wrestle that objective, and that will definitely help keep pink in the game. Nice burning uh, alignment. Not burning alignment there, but fiery convocation. It's the boundability of Teclas. Could have been a little bit stronger right down the pipe here. Bomber mobs nuking into the Illyrian Reavers. And it looks like the Fireborn are still going. The Chad Fireborn. They're hanging in there tooth and nail. Depth Guard polearms engaging against the Spearmen here with the animated Hulks. So it looks like Houseplant's going to be making a play for the side point. With the Depth Guard and the Hulk combo, he probably should. Doggo's coming out of reserve. So we see Scurvy Dogs being called out of the Vanguard point here. And the Night Terrors are back in business, baby. They're going to be heading towards Objective 1 right here. As we do see this battle unfolding, absolutely crazy stuff all over the battlefield. Peckless coming over, chasing these off. And it looks like the Hives do manage to get that objective. Couple of spears here. Houseplant's going to need to make sure he pulls some units back to the objective. Or else the elves might be able to ninja him and get a triple cap, which would be very, very troublesome. Even still, value is very close in this game. Doggo's nibbling away at the Reavers and soon should be able to kill off these Lothar and Sea Guard. And Houseplant will probably maneuver over and get that objective. In the middle, it looks like Coast did delve a little bit too greedily and too deeply here as Houseplant pulls back with these zombie pirate jackhand mobs heading up towards objective number two. So he is on his way. The, house, the High Elves are really scrapping hard in this game. It kind of looks like things are going south and then we see a little bit of a pullback here. Some nice ninjas on the objectives here from Pink. It's been a, a, good, proper, uh, a good proper duel of fates. So here comes the terrors in the night, the night terrors, as they are just going to be cleaving through these bad boys. And uh, that is going to be a righteous butchering. So those archers do get pushed off, and the objective is going to be flipping. Heavy cap weight there. Middle objective taken by the elves. So the elves do get a double cap, and the score is pretty close here in this game. Archers and silver and guard making their way towards the middle. Archer positions now are more or less back online. So this could be a point where the high elves do start to accrue some decent value. Slostra on summon could be a thing. We see depth guard basic variants coming out, so that could be useful for helping to grind through copious amounts of spears and silver and guard and all those different kind of units. Peckless still causing some big disruption in the middle, you know, using his bird wings to go after the old Lamprey's Revenge and he's doing a good job of it. Armor piercing, Lamprey's Revenge, of course, do not like that fire damage that he does and silver and guards are very, very resilient fighters. 
With the sheer amount of numbers, able to get the objective back. So we do see the Depth Guard pole arms return. They will be able to put a beating on the Silver and Guard with their armor piercing, of course. And it looks like the coastline has taken back objective number two, ladies and gentlemen. On the backside, heavy pressure. Looks like the animated hulks have moved in. Silver helms have come in to intercept, and they'll do okay on the on the charge. I think that the high elves need to find a way to get their uh, dragon princes back, the ROR's, because it seems like houseplant strategy is very heavily revolving around hulks and morngulls, different things like that. So you're going to need a way to um, you know deal with that. And I think the best thing that he had was the fireborn, the Fusro Da. They were doing very well. Silver and guard here, negative fourteen leadership, getting buckled under the weight of the uh, coastline here as the old Depth Guard move in with their armor piercing. Crabs, of course, do AP as well, so Silver and Guard not going to hold up super well against that. A couple Spears and Silver and trying to move in. Reavers helping clear out some of the Doggos as we do get some Lothar and Sea Guard focus fire that's going to be coming. Coast looks like they're yielding value a bit. A lot of their units here in the backfield are getting punished, so Houseplant probably going to be going for an objective victory at this point because I think High Elves are going to continue pulling a value lead, especially since, you know, High Elves have a very impactful Lord on the battlefield, whereas Coast went with, like, a Celestron summon. And the Winds of Death is, is probably, I mean, I wonder if he even has any left. We'll have to see. The boss fight continues, guys. It continues indeed. Objective number three taken by the Coast. So the Coast is going to get that, giving them a triple cap. But the Elves should be able to retake objective number one. We do need to see Pink do a little bit of unsummoning. It seems like Pink has a lot of tattered units on the battlefield, which might mean they're having some problems with um, reinforcements. Because if you don't unsummon your beat-up units... Uh, efficiently, what happens is you can run out of units to bring in from reserves because a lot of your units are still on the battlefield idling and things like that. So, Scurvy Dogs chasing down the Silver and Guard. Depth Guard going to be heading towards the middle. And the Hylves are trying desperately to get this back. But those Depth Guard are no joke. They are, uh, if, they, if there's not a lot of things to focus fire down Depth Guard, they can last a long time because the thing about them is they heal in combat. So when they're fighting in combat, they're just constantly healing. And now we get the Fireborn coming out once again. All right. It's a strong play. Fireborn should definitely maneuver around with Teclas and go steal objective number three. If they do that, that's pretty much a freebie. Uh, you take the Fireborn, you go towards this objective here, you take Peclos, and that's free. Although on this side, it looks like there's a bit of a threat as well. So yeah, we do see Morngulls and Animated Hulk. So this is a good play too. Moving over this direction, stabilizing the one objective that you do have to make sure you don't get too behind on points, I think is going to be quite smart. So Fireborn coming. The Ungabunga is here. Animated Hulks heading up to the middle. Side objective, the Elves are going to be pressuring that. Scurvy Dogs will probably head over that way. I'd wager Fiery Convocation. Oh yeah, that's going to be cool. And it does go through the zombies. Does a little bit of damage to them. Not terrible. Hits those Depth Guard pull arms. Actually does some good work. Lothan Sea Guard about to get massacred by Depth Guard. The Depth Guard are just going to cut them to pieces. Anti-infantry bonus. Almost 60 weapon strength against light armor. I mean, sign, sign them up, dude. That's their ideal habitat right there. So Archer is still doing it. Unsummon's going down on Lothar and Seaguard, and the Morngulls lurking in the shadows. Houseplant always planning ahead, playing 3D chess here, but really good isolation here by Pink. Pink able to find those animated hulks and get that engagement right there. So we do see the crumbling going down. Negative 24 leadership as the Fireborn do get some nice DACA, not DACA, but nice lance charges on those bad boys. Peckless up in the sky trying to shut down the bomber mobs. Bomber mobs do, they have good AP, even if it doesn't say it in the tooltip. They do pretty good against armor. High Elves wrestling one. Guys, this game is getting really close. I mean, the High Elves are definitely getting a lot of pressure on the points. We do see the Morngulls making their way over for a bit of a ninja cap. They're going to get taken down by the Spears and the Cavalry charges, most likely. These Fireborn are just absolute chads this game. 3,000 value so far, but they've been summoned twice. So you got you to gotta keep tabs on that. Peckless up in the sky, going after the Jack Dropper bombers, enabling those bad boys down. Here we do see Illyrian Reavers moving towards objective number three, and it looks like the Elves are going to have that one. As animated hulks make their way over, but... Could it be that Houseplant might start losing momentum here? Maybe, you know, not having the invos is a big thing. Invos on Depth Guard is so cost effective and all he has is Winds of Death, uh, which of course is good against Hyle Spear formations and whatnot. But yeah, I don't know if it's getting the job done, guys. I do not know if it's getting the job. So looking here, we do see objective number one being held by the Elves. And I do think the value gap is becoming devastating. Looks like Pink is pulling massively ahead as Peckless is just chasing down these air forces. And over towards objective number three, we do see the Illyrian Reavers as well as a second unit of Reavers screening out the advancing units. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that Pink has maybe defeated the final boss on today's stream. We'll have to see. We will have to see. So Reaver charge in there. Hulk's going to be shut down. Hulks are pretty bad against cavalry charges, especially Light Cav. Because uh, their armor piercing really doesn't you know, do too much for them. Elves holding on to this point with some spears. What are the reinforcements going to be for pink, silver, and guard? You know, basic spears and Lothar and Sea Guard heading up to the objective here. Definitely Tekla should go in for the kill on that Vampire Fleet Captain if he can. But blocking up these units here is going to be good. Houseplant is almost to the point where he could win on one objective. We're going to see what he's going to be able to do. But Fireborn are on their way in. And those Fireborn are going to be a big, big problem here. They're going to for sure hammer down these Depth Guard. So what are they doing? Here they come. 
the old Fireborn moving across, and they are just looking for those big, juicy engagements here. They're going to head after the animated hulks, get those goodies going, and now, yes, we are in the second phase of our glorious battle, but elves are not going to relinquish this easy. Lothar and Seaguard, again, are spear units, and these are all animated hulks. Calling out deckhand mobs in the late game does sometimes feel bad, so it's usually going to be a combination of scurvy dogs and hulks and monsters that you call out. Reavers here do get bunker busted down, and if anybody could find a way to win this game, it would be Houseplant. He's one of those players who just uh, is so scrappy and so hard to finish off. So Reavers moving across. Not Reavers, excuse me, the dreaded Fireborn. Uh, Teclis did not bring regrowth, so there's not going to be any fat heals for those bad boys. Rather, Teclis has Flock of Doom as well as Net of Amitok, both of which are pretty good. And the Fireborn going to be just massacring these uh, animated hulks here. That's going to be a bully beatdown. Granted, three animated hulks might be able to team up against the Fireborn and do it. Especially if the dogs get around the back and surround them. That could be a big momentum shift, if possible. Middle objective being held by the Death Guard. Death Guard just doing the work of, uh, of the coastline here. As these uh, Death Guard pull arms need to get back on the objective. Make sure they are providing their capture weight to the cause here. And uh, once again, here comes the big fight. So the doggos swarming in. Fireborn getting a great engagement versus the animated hulks is pretty cool. A lot of people would be worried about bringing Fireborn against like a heavy shooting faction. But I guess Coast, I find that like I like to play Gunline Coast, but there's a lot of people who like to play Coast more like this, like monsters and, you know, infantry spam and, uh, you know, more diving and bombers and things like that. Gunline Coast can be good, but it's very weak against Archer play. So you have to kind of, you have to judge that one out. So animated hulks getting taken down and the Chad Fireborn literally just taking on the entire Coast army here, which is probably going to end the game. Uh, because if, if this this is like the last hoorah of Houseplant, if those guys aren't able to get going, then I think it's going to be game blouses. And currently, the single cap situation isn't even on the table anymore. Houseplant's basically, I think, lost this game. A couple more goals creeping from the other side. Maybe going to be able to ninja. The Depth Guard grinding away quite quite well, um, cutting through a lot of the high elf units. But the capture weight is there as Reavers do make their way in. And the Fireborn basically solo this entire portion of the army. Brutal. They're up to 3,700 value. Coast really didn't have too many answers for them, right? There wasn't any big lord or a character that could do much against them so they are going to be paying the troll tool whereas i don't even know how would you traditionally deal with them with uh with vampire coast handgun mobs could definitely shoot them down but they would also be a little bit vulnerable to being dove but yeah i think mortar play could be good but man high elf diving is really good too it's so hard to defend mortars against reavers it's so incredibly hard so death guard on the point and they're still trying to hold it but the objective does flip to the high elves houseplant needs to find a point here quick and he does manage to get one on the side. So this is a good play by Houseplant. And just, you see what I'm saying? He's like behind, but he just like always finds a way to still kind of be in the game. So we do get the Silver Helms being called out and the Night Terror should be able to deal with them. So the Night Terrors will stay on that objective and make sure they capture that. On the other side, the Fireborn solo the entire core here. They just do it. They're up to 4,000 value on two summons, which is about what they cost. So they're basically paid for themselves with a little bit of excess. And the Lothern Sea Guard going to be finishing those bad boys off. Warren Gold's moving up to the middle. Death Guard's still fighting super well. These Death Guard have been pretty, pretty chad there fighting on that point. But we do see Vampire Coast retaining the side objective. If Houseplant can find a way to wrestle an objective back anytime here soon, maybe. Maybe he still has a chance. Morngulls and Animated Hulks, the remnants of that Haggard squad there moving up. I would wager a Scurvy Dog Summon is going to be the play for Houseplant. He's going to come around the back and try and dive those Lothern Seeger right there. And Houseplant continuing to just fight as those Death Guard fight. But clearly Pink knows what they're doing. Holding here, holding here, holding here. And that is a lot of cap weight that isn't like being mulched by the Death Guard. And I think it's just over. I don't think Houseplant's got any chances here. Granted, this is a cost-effective fight. The Night Terrors and the Doggos should do well, but Peckless will be able to turn the tide of this fight. I have to say, the Peckless pick has been badass. Peckless sitting at almost 4,000 value right now, which is awesome. Now, the Necrofaxes are pretty terrible, honestly. I don't know why. They just, uh, maybe an accuracy increase would be really nice for them. But overall, they're just they're just not very good. So yeah, Peckless going to be closing in on 4,000 value here this game. Crazy to see Fireborn and Peckless just putting the game on the back. And Peckless is not meta at all. Like, and seeing that being picked is cool. So GG, well played. That is going to officially seal the deal for today's stream. Pink is going to be the king of the hill, taking down the final boss. Um, yeah, so hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Great game. Great game indeed. That was fun. It was cool to see uh, Houseplant's take on Coast too. He probably doesn't play them or practice them, but even still, that's the nature of this stream is to force people out of their comfort zones. Uh, Sloster was a bit of a bust. She didn't seem to really do much. Um, the Morgul ambush initially was really good. I thought that was really cool. And the Depth Guard did good also. So yeah, there were certain variables. The Fireborn were just such a hard counter against that monster squad. So 4,300 right there. And uh, we do also have Pink's Lord doing really good at 3,900 there. So... That was a lot of fun, guys. GG, well played. Hopefully you enjoyed that one. We'll see you all around. If you enjoyed this stream, please do drop a like on the way out. It helps quite a bit. It helps keep the old Total War engine going, baby. 
And uh, again, thank you guys who donated today and to new channel members, all you folks, it really, really means the world. So thank you so much. And uh, that's it. You guys take care of yourselves, yeah? Adios, Dovitendia. Well played to Pink and Houseplant here in our final game.